Okay, it is 1.05, so it's time for us to start. And there will be a few more people joining as, uh, as we go along, but welcome to our 2020 Orange County Economic and Real Estate Outlook. Uh, we have a great program this afternoon, and of course it's 2020, so we are virtual today. Uh, needless to say, this is an uncertain time. And at least some of the uncertainty was put to rest this past weekend, but much remains. Uh, in this webinar, our goal is to delve into some of these topics and to provide a roadmap as to how we understand the potential deviations of the forecast outlook, particularly as it impacts Orange County as the current uncertainty begins to uh, resolve itself. So the program uh, this afternoon is jointly sponsored by the Zyman Institute for Real Estate at UCLA. Uh, for many years, we have hel held this conference uh, on the campus of our sister institution, the University of California at Irvine, and at least my virtual background here, which is the uh, Paul Mirage School of Business, uh, keeps us there again for this Orange County Outlook conference. And hopefully, Next year, we will be live again on campus. We have some encouraging news today that suggests that that is uh, at least a little bit more likely uh, than it was uh, prior to this morning. So let me share my screen and I'll go through uh, what our agenda is for the day. And Go to, okay, and I'm assuming that you all can see that. Uh, so uh, again, this is our 2020 Orange County Regional Economic Outlook. Uh, and the agenda for the day is uh, now for this these five minutes, uh, we'll be doing the welcome and introductions. And then we're gonna go on to the economic outlook for the nation and the state. Uh, and I will be uh, delivering that. Uh, you should have uh, a Slido code and uh, you can ask questions in the Slido. We have a very tight time schedule here. We'll try to get the, to those questions uh, that may or may not be possible. Uh, however, we do have a break upcoming and I'll be looking at the Slido during the break and also addressing some of the questions at that time. Uh, then following my presentation will be William Yu, who's an economist at the UCLA Anderson Forecast, talking about foreign tourism and Orange County. And uh, then we're uh, pleased to uh, have with us Professor Ed Colson, who's director of the Center for Real Estate and a professor at UCI's Mirage School of Business. And he'll talk about the market outlook for Orange County with particular emphasis on hospitality and real estate. At that point, we'll take a break. Uh, we come back with a special presentation from the chief economist uh, for Fannie Mae, uh, Doug Duncan, and then an expert panel uh, who is going to try to help us interpret what the last three days mean for the forecast and mean for the future we have some time at the end of that panel for Q&A for the panel and then the closing. So let me just turn for the moment to a very important aspect of the program. We are, as you all know, a public institution and we could not do our research and bring you these programs without the generous support of our sponsors who really have stayed with us and we are most grateful our principal sponsor for this conference is RSM, our platinum sponsors, University Credit Union and the law firm of Allen Matkins, uh, our silver sponsors, California Bank and Trust, Lancy Homes and Vaco, who's joined us as a new sponsor and our bronze sponsors, Clark, Colliers, Hathaway Dinwiddie and MBK Real Estate Companies. Again, we are most grateful for our sponsors 
And many of these you recognize as also sponsors of uh, research projects that we do and bring to you uh, at our conferences. Uh, and so many thanks to them. Uh, now, moving on, let's talk about the US. Uh, obviously, the uh, big deal of, for the US economy is the pandemic. And uh, I'd like to start out, and maybe some of you have heard me talk about this before, but with the picture over on the left, uh, in part because the Dodgers won the World Series. I know we're in Orange County, and uh, the Angels, unfortunately, were not uh, in the World Series this year, maybe next year. But at any rate, this is 1918. 1918 was the height of the last big pandemic in the US. And some of the baseball players were in Europe uh, because it was the time of World War I, but many players became ill due to the uh, influenza uh, pathogen. And so teams were calling up promising young players from the minor leagues, the Boston Red Sox, called up a promising young pitcher, and they went on to win the World Series. That pitcher won the first and fourth game of the World Series. And uh, so baseball fans know who that is. It's Babe Ruth. Uh, he's also a slugger, obviously. And for reasons not known to this day, he was traded right after the season to the New York Yankees. Uh, but what is important here is that Boston was so excited about their team that they opened up early, as did Philadelphia for other reasons. And the health outcomes and the economic outcomes were worse for those two cities than for St. Louis. And what it points out today, there's just one data point, and you can't extrapolate too much from one data point or much at all, uh, but it does point out that the course of this pandemic is important for our economic forecast, not just the course of the pandemic, but the public policy response to it. So what are we assuming? Uh, keep in mind that we're not epidemiologists. Uh, and so this is purely an assumption. But the assumption is that the pandemic in 2021 and 2022 has a moderate to low impact on the economy. Uh, and, you know, that a few weeks ago seemed like a very heroic assumption. Uh, after the announcement by Pfizer today, uh, it seems like less heroic an assumption, uh, particularly since it's coupled with uh, a task force made up of scientists and, and physicians uh, to have an organized uh, anti-pandemic policy. Uh, so that is our assumption. If that assumption is too optimistic, or turns out to be too optimistic, then uh, obviously so is our forecast. So that's something to keep your eye on. The second is that we have a stimulus package in this forecast that occurs in the fourth quarter of 2020. Even if it does pass in the fourth quarter of 2020, and there's some real doubt that it will, it's not going to hit until later in the first quarter of 2021, and so that means that the fourth quarter of 2020 will be weaker than what we show you. And the first quarter should be a little stronger. And we still think there will be a stimulus package, although that might uh, not hit the economy until February or March. And then the third is that the near-term economic policy with taxes and spending are not radically changed after the election. And if we have a uh, divided Congress, uh, between the Senate and the House of Representatives, I think that assumption probably is still going to hold. So let's jump into the forecast. These are the recent GDP numbers, uh, and we have 2018, 19, and 2020, three quarters of 2020. A big drop there, first quarter 5%, then, uh, then a huge drop and a bounce back of 32, uh, roughly 32%. That's going to be revised. Uh, this week, I believe it is, will be the second GDP release. And so those numbers look really good and it looks kind of like a V, but one thing to keep in mind is that in the third quarter of 2020, 
GDP, in spite of its extremely rapid growth on an annual basis, remains three and a half percent below the peak. So right now we're in a place that is comparable to where we were in the depths of the Great Recession. Still a big hole to climb out of. And the question is, where do we go from here? How do we make a forecast in these unprecedented times where the data are conflated with a public health crisis? And one of the places to look is when we experienced uh, in the past a situation where there was a fear of consuming some services. And uh, this is just an example here. This is US revenue passenger miles uh, flown. So they're domestic pa revenue passenger miles. That's one person flying one mile in a seat they paid for on a domestic flight. And it's from January 20, uh, 2000 to September 2004. And you kind of go along moving your eyes from the left to the right. It's at about 60 billion. And in March of 2001, we began a recession. You don't get a lot of impact there. It was a very mild recession actually. But then we have the horrific attacks of 9-11 and you get the big drop there. Now flights were uh, shut down only for a few days. And so you get a bounce back over the next couple of months as uh, air marshals and TSA and reinforced cockpit doors came into play but you notice that it's not a complete bounce back. It's kind of like what we just saw in the GDP numbers. And then there's a slow increase. And what happened here was that there's a difference in the, uh, uh, the feeling about risk on the part of individuals. So those who were more risk averse wanted to see that uh, flying was indeed safe and that all of these uh, things like TSA for all of its faults was still working and uh, they could feel safe. And there are others who said, yeah, everything is fine and I'm willing to take the risk. So those who are, I don't really want to say risk taking, but less risk averse. Uh, on the left, this was Labor Day. They went to Redondo Beach and enjoyed the beach. And those who were more risk averse went out on a trail that's like on the left-hand side, the Chora Grande Trail in the Sespe Wilderness. And, uh, and more than socially distanced from other people. That's what we have now because the recession is affecting the services that are human contact services more than any other aspect of the economy. And that leads us to uh, our real consumption. Uh, and we have real consumption as a percentage of the peak in GDP, the peak being the fourth quarter of 2019. And you see the same kind of uh, partial V stroke uh, coming to the third quarter. And then we come out to the forecast and our forecast is for a long, slow uh, recovery, recovering uh, real consumption uh, out into the 2022 timeframe. Uh, we still think that's a fairly good assumption, although the change in the stimulus package from the fourth quarter to the first quarter is going to is going to make that fourth quarter weaker and the first quarter stronger. Uh, and well, well, before I go on, uh, keep in mind that this is 70% of GDP. So if consumption is growing more slowly because people are waiting to feel confident that they can be safe purchasing services that are human contact services, the rest of GDP to get a more rapid growth in GDP is going to have to be made up by the other 30%, which is uh, purchases from foreigners. And we know that's not gonna happen because uh, very few countries are doing very well at this point in time or investment uh, or government purchases of goods and services. So we'll talk about those uh, in uh, just a moment, but just to give you our uh, GDP uh, forecast, uh, what we have here is uh, the red blocks, and it's a steady growth as the pandemic fades. It looks very much like the consumption one. Again, keep in mind uh, what's happening with the stimulus. And, uh, and, and again, we don't see any real difference in 2021 uh, with a Biden administration coming in because uh, the Senate is, is still open. Now, if 
uh, the Georgia seats end up going to the Democrats, that's going to make a difference than if, uh, if they go to the Republicans. Now that looks pretty good and we get back in 2022 to our previous peak and in fact exceed our previous peak. Uh, and as recessions go, that's a fairly short-lived uh, downturn and recovery. But if you look on the left-hand side, 2018 and 2019, where we had growth, that was a 2.4% economy. And just draw a line through that, and you find that at the end of 2022, we're still way behind trend. And, uh, and so it basically means that we've had little or no growth uh, for more than two years. Uh, and, and that certainly weighs on unemployment. It means we have a higher unemployment rate and, uh, and, and we don't have a full recovery in employment. Uh, so now moving on, here is something that we're looking at and we're concerned with. This is weekly initial claims uh, and they are stubbornly high. Now the latest numbers still stay in the 700,000 at the peak of the Great Recession, they were just above 600,000. So we're not even down to that. We think this is going to fall fairly fast over the, over the coming months. Uh, but it is of concern that there's still a lot of layoffs happening. There are a lot of hirings, but a lot of layoffs. So it's something we're keeping our eye on. Uh, turning to monetary policy and how is that going to be uh, rolled out and affect uh, the economy. Well, the Fed has a new interest rate policy. Here's Chairman Powell uh, talking about it. And, and the policy is basically this. For the former policy balanced the risk of inflation with the risk of unemployment. The new policy says, we're gonna ignore inflation and just focus on unemployment and not just the overall US unemployment rate, but the unemployment rate amongst types of person who, per, uh, people who are unemployed and if we see the inflation rate significantly above 2%, whatever that means, uh, for a long period of time, again, whatever that means, then we'll start to think about raising interest rates. So in our forecast, we have basically uh, interest rates at zero, the Fed funds rate, and, uh, and that leaves us with a T-bill rate that is under one and uh, very low mortgage rates as well. So that should be good for business investment and for personal investment in housing. So this is part of that 30% uh, that's not consumption. And here's our forecast for non-residential fixed investment, which is equipment, software, structures that we're gonna hear a lot more about today. And, uh, and amongst the structures are oil drilling rigs. And, that, and that's actually a big part of this. So we see a, a fairly sharp, increase in, uh, in the percentage change is on a seasonally adjusted annual rate. And then it kind of comes back down and it settles in at about 5%, better than the previous average due to the lower interest rates. But banks are also uh, increasing lending standards. So it's not off the charts. It's not going to move that GDP needle, but uh, it is pretty good investment and mostly concentrated in over this time frame in uh, other than structures. Uh, however, with homes, we see a different story and we've got home sales uh, have, have really soared and that's due to low interest rates. It's also due to some movement out to the suburbs and that leads to our forecast for housing starts. And you see the peak there, but we don't think this has legs. We think that uh, a lot of what's going on here are individuals who were planning, so these would be millennials, who were planning on starting families and moving to the suburbs in 2021, 2022, 2023, but were staying in the city for all of those city amenities until that time. Now those amenities are shut down and we see them beginning to move uh, and take advantage of those low interest rates. So we've got a lot of pull forward in housing that affects housing starts. Still we're at 1.3 million, for the US, which is a good bit above uh, our previous averages. Uh, for government, the last part of that 30%, federal deficits remain above 1 trillion a year. So don't expect to see goods and services growing, uh, except very modestly. And uh, eventually these transfers 
uh, are going to decline and they're going to decline sharply. We're seeing that right now in the fourth quarter of this year. If we get a new stimulus package, it's likely to be a one-time uh, event because of these large federal deficits. And for state and local governments, uh, they are beginning a contraction now. We don't see in any new stimulus package aid coming from the federal government. And as we get into the next fiscal year, we're expecting further, uh, if not further contraction, at least a stabilization, but not growth. So none of these other 30% are really going to change what we think is happening with consumption and its impact on GDP. So now turning to California in the few minutes left that I have, uh, this is payroll job loss from February to April 2020. The gold is California and the blue is the US. And it's the sectors that were hit the hardest. So payroll jobs on the left, then leisure and hospitality, retail trade, healthcare and social services and other services. It looks very much like the US. Now you hear a lot about how California is just growing slower than the US and what's going on. And you can see that uh, in this chart where the unemployment rate for California over there in gold is, uh, is second only to Hawaii. That's simply because the opening has been slower, not because there's anything uh, else going on. And uh, so we're expecting California to look very much like the US. Uh, let me jump into just a couple of sectors that are, uh, are California specific. So this is the blue is the forecast uh, through 2020 Q4. The dashed line, uh, if the blue hits the dashed line, it's a full recovery. And uh, the other two blocks are gonna be April, 2020 and August of 2020. And you see over on the right-hand side, these are the recovery sectors, information, professional and business services, that's technology, uh, financial activities, which include real estate, uh, but very much a function of the liquidity in the system. The next one is government, which really doesn't change except that spike there. The, those are census workers. And then transportation, warehousing, uh, and utilities. And uh, that's the shift to online shopping more than anything else. But over on the left-hand side, we have leisure and hospitality and retail. Those are the human contact sectors. Those are the troubled sectors. And we really don't see a recovery at the end of our forecast horizon. Let me point out one other sector, which is education, healthcare, and social services. And it is just about recovered. It took a big hit, uh, principally with dentist offices, but also the reason why you don't get a full recovery there is daycare is part of that. And until we get uh, back to the same employment levels, uh, daycare is going to keep this sector from fully recovering. Uh, a couple of other items, international tourism has collapsed, and you're going to hear more from that with our other speakers. Uh, what is encouraging is that now that the U.S. has a plan for uh, fighting the pandemic, this might come back quicker than we expect. Uh, we have, a, you know, about a 30-month recovery. Uh, but as of now, we're not seeing any evidence that that would be true. Uh, although seaport traffic certainly is held up and that affects our logistics industry. And interestingly, the uh, trade war with China doesn't really show up much here. Uh, but home sales have bounced back and uh, are at, at least in the last uh, number of years, at record levels. And home prices really have not retreated as they do normally in a recession. So housing is kind of the outlier. It usually tanks in a recession, and we don't see that nationally. We don't see it in California. Uh, and our forecast for uh, new residential permits uh, has, unlike the U.S., increasing uh, permits, increasing home building. So the construction industry is going to be an expanding industry in California. Part of the reason is changes in regulations that have been happening, making it easier, not easy, but easier uh, to go ahead and build. Uh, and part of the reason is this pent up demand for housing in California. And the third reason is rebuilding after these horrific wildfires. So housing is a bright spot in California that brings us to our forecast. 
uh, which has declining unemployment and at the end of 2022 under 6% and increase in employment, but we don't get back to our previous peak uh, in employment in uh, the forecast horizon. And so to conclude, uh, we have broken employment relations and they take time to heal. The Fed's new policy, low rates for the foreseeable future with housing a bright spot in the near term, particularly for California. Fiscal policy is really limited. And so don't expect that to do much, but California's will outperform the US in technology and high income jobs will lag in leisure and hospitality and low income jobs. And the uh, inequality that we've talked about for a decade, absent a policy intervention in California will get worse. So that brings me to the end of my time. And uh, as I said, during the break, I'll look at a Slido and try and answer some questions. But let me at this point, turn the program over to uh, William Yu. William's an economist with the forecast and he works on special topics, including uh, tourism in Orange County. So William, over to you. All right, Jerry, thank you. Let me share my slides. Hello everyone. So today I would like to talk about tourism and the Orange County economy. I'm going to show you how the pandemic impacts the tourism and the leisure and hospitality industry in Orange County and the United States. Okay, so in this chart, I show you the annualized number of passenger arrival and departure domestic and international combined through LAX. And we can see the number collapse during the pandemic from 88 million by about 80%. Okay, in this chart, I show you different statistics. This is the daily air travelers going through all the TSA checkpoints in the United States. The blue line is the number, daily number in 2019, and the red line is the number in 2020. So we can see the air travel plunge in March and April, recovered in May and June, but it has not recovered much since the summertime we believe is due to the COVID second wave. In November, all US air travel is still 70% lower than the same time last year. In this chart, I show you the total monthly international traveler spendings, including airfares, lodging, uh, tourist spending, and tuition paid by international students since 1999. The blue line is the foreign tourist spending in the United States. The green line is the US tourist spending abroad and both collapsed in the pandemic by about 79%. And know that about 15% of the overseas uh, tourists visit Southern California and that translates into about $35 billion spending or revenues annually. So uh, by looking at the loss during the pandemic, the total revenue loss uh, for the tourism due to the COVID-19 uh, for Southern California could be up to $25 billion. Um, and the other thing I want to show you is uh, see this uh, purple dash line. So as Jerry mentioned before, after 9-11, it took three years for international tourist spending to back to the previous peak. And during the Great Recession, it took 2.5 years to return to its previous peak. So we can use this past information to predict the speed of the recovery uh, this time. Okay, so here I show you the percentage jar, percentage change of jar in the leisure and hospitality industry since March 2008. And there's no doubt the pandemic really damaged this sector severely. The blue line is the US and the orange line is for Orange County. And we can see 
the Orange County leisure and hospitality sector was growing faster in the past several years. But from February to September 2020, US leisure and hospitality sectors lost about 22% of jobs, while Orange County lost 30% of jobs. And why? It is because California has more stringent mitigation policies than the nation. Okay, in these slides, I show you the percentage of jobs in the leisure and hospitality sector over the total jobs for the top 20 metropolitan areas among the 100 largest metropolitan area in the United States. So in other words, the higher the ratio, the more important of tourism for the local economy. And not surprisingly, the number one metro um, is Las Vegas, followed by Orlando, uh, the home of Disney World, and Honolulu, New Orleans, and Orange County is number five. About 13.6% of jobs in Orange County is at leisure and hospitality sectors, higher than the 10.8% for the national average. And we can estimate the GDP in leisure and hospitality sector in Orange County is about $13 billion in 2019. All right, in this chart, I show you the percentage change of jobs in the leisure and hospitality sectors for those uh, top 20 majors in tourism. The blue line is the percentage change of job from February to April, the worst time of the pandemic and recession. And the bar shows the percentage change from February to September, reflecting the current status. So let's focus on the bar. So the metro with the most travel related job lost uh, is Honolulu, in general, Hawaii, by about 57%. And followed by New Orleans, Orlando, and San Francisco, they are all about 34% declines. Orange County, as you can see, uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, is in the middle. Up to September, it is about 30% of declines. Okay. So here I show you the job number for the subsectors sub in the leisure and hospitality sectors in Orange County in 2020. The blue line is the limited services eating place like McDonald's down by 18%. The black line is the full service restaurant down by 26%, but it has some kind of strong recovery since uh, April and May. The green line is arts, entertainment, recreation, including amusements such as uh, Disneyland workers. And the red line is jobs in accommodation or hotels. So this bottom two subsectors suffer more loss, about like a 40 plus percentage. Okay, in this chart, um, I show you amount 100 largest metro, the horizontal axis shows the percentage change of jobs in leisure and hospitality sector from February to September. And the vertical axis show the percentage change of the total non-farm payroll job in that metro during the same period. And we are not surprised to see that there's a high correlation between these two variables during the pandemic for two reasons. Number one, because our leisure and hospitality sector is part of the total economy jobs. Number two, a metro will got hit harder, uh, not only in the leisure and hospitality sector, they will also hit harder uh, with other sectors. And know that Honolulu is the worst metro, followed by New York City. So among these metros, Orange County is in the middle. We can say not too good, but not too bad. Okay, finally, um, summary and outlook. So Orange County has a higher share of the leisure and hospitality sectors over the total economy. 
and Orange County's leisure and hospitality sectors lost more percentage of jobs than the national average during the pandemic. However, compared to other famous tourist metros, the recovery of leisure and hospitality sectors in Orange County fare better than Hawaii, Orlando, New York City, and San Francisco. And I uh, know that we didn't include this uh, recent announcement of a uh, uh, layoff in, uh, in Disney because we haven't seen the number yet in September or in October. Okay, and we predict it is likely to take three years uh, up to 2023, first quarter, for Orange County leisure and hospitality sectors to fully return to its pre-COVID-19 level. Um, but with today's good news on vaccine, it could be faster. And we suggest that domestic tourism will recover much faster than the international tourism. Okay, so this is my presentation. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn over to our next speaker, uh, Professor Edward Carlson. He's the professor of economics and University of California, Irvine. And he's also the director of the Center for Real Estate at UCI Mirage School of Management. We are very honored to have him in our conference. So Ed, the floor is yours. Thank you, I'm William. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I am not able to share. Oh, yes, I am. So first of all, thank you very much to um, Jerry and the team for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, I'm very honored to, uh, to be speaking with you today. Um, and I, I'm glad that Jerry has such a, um, a, a broad vision of, of partnerships uh, with sister campuses. Um, and that's really great. Um, so uh, again, the, my name's Ed Colson. I am uh, the director for the Center for Real Estate at the Palmerage School of Business at the University of California, Irvine. The picture you're seeing here is of the plaza in front of our fairly new building. And it's actually right around the corner from, from Jerry's uh, background shot. Uh, on the left there is, is the new building. On the right is the old building. And right where this, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right where this gentleman is sitting, we've turned this into an outdoor classroom with uh, proper social distancing and full audio visual uh, technology capability so that we can actually, we're actually holding class uh, this quarter. And I hope to be teaching in person next quarter as well, uh, given some proper social distancing. So we're, I'm very optimistic about, about um, UCI's ability to move forward through this pandemic uh, in, in good order. So again, thank you, Jerry, for your um, uh, welcoming me to this, uh, to this forum today. Um, so what I'm going to, I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, some of them are very similar to what we just saw, uh, from, from William, uh, because it is undoubtedly the case that, um, leisure and hospitality are a, are a big-ish part of, um, the Orange County economy. But I want to take a slightly broader view of the Orange County economy as well, uh, not minimizing the uh, importance of leisure and hospitality. So, um, the picture of Orange County that we had pre-pandemic was of a very, very vigorous economy, but one that's kind of reaching its constraints. And when when I was talking with Jerry back maybe in January about you know the the this forum that was supposed to take place in March or April, uh, he had suggested, and I agreed that that actually might be the theme of of my presentation of, of Orange County as being one that that has, has been so vigorous and so such a vital economy that, um, that we might be reaching some supply side constraints. I wanna show you some pictures that kind of back that up at least as it, as it was in February of this year. So um, here's the unemployment rate. All this data is from, from Fred. If you don't know Fred and you're interested, if you're in, in being a data person, um, Fred is a, 
invaluable resource. Uh, it's public, all the publicly available data that's produced by the federal government and some beyond that is just easy to download and display. So here's the Orange County unemployment rate. That's in blue. The uh, national unemployment rates uh, in red. And you can see that ever since we've come out of the recession, whether we came out of that recession in 2010 or 2012 depends on what you're looking at and what and what um, area of the country you're looking at. But basically, Orange County came out of the recession in 2010. Unemployment started to decline around then and um, deviated significantly from the national unemployment rate beginning in about 2012 or 13 and has been consistently below the national figure uh, since then. All of, all of which is just a, it's just, um, just a continuation of a, of a broader trend in, in market expansion that's occurred since, um, since about 2008, really. Um, uh, wages are higher in Orange County than in the nation as a whole. You can see that that's been rising at a steady clip ever since about 2012 or 2013 uh, and has kept uh, there's been kind of this constant gap between uh, Orange County wages and national wages since about 2013. And of course, a lot of that is eaten up by higher rents and housing prices, but nevertheless, it is, it is a significantly different picture that we see in Orange County than in um, the broader uh, uh, US economy. The, the supply constraints that I'm talking about are most easily represented by this picture, which is basically my picture of local growth. It's very hard to get up to the minute data on, on growth in a local economy. So the normal thing that we do is look at total employment. And you can see that, and I've normalized this so that we can get them on the same uh, graph. I've normalized these numbers so that uh, January of 2010 has an index value of 100. And you can see that Orange County grew slightly faster over the initial period uh, from 2010 to about 2016. But after that, growth in Orange County really began to slow down and, and total employment's almost flat from 2017 going forward. So there's a picture here of, a, of an economy that's doing great, but one which is maybe built out and so that we can't, it's, it's become very difficult to expand employment beyond um, a certain level here. Now, all these pictures, I'm gonna scroll back and forth here, all these pictures end in February of 2020. So this is all pre-pandemic. Um, and then house prices, as, as Jerry mentioned, house prices have been continuing at their standard pace. So here's, these are also our indexes. So you can see the recession here, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the, the end of the housing bus really, and then some spectacular growth in Orange County house prices initially coming out of that recession uh, and a little bit slower from the national economy as a whole, but still very robust growth in housing prices. And this has basically carried on uh, through the, the pandemic here. Um, and one of the reasons, of course, is that we have such robust growth in house prices uh, is of course the economy, but there's also supply constraints. And I actually, you know, I re-downloaded this data and I was just astonished by this. This is a housing permits. We don't, the, the central, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics does not tell us housing starts by region. All they do is show us permits by region. So this is permits, but it's a pretty good indicator of, of where housing markets are going. Um, this is so this is permits per thousand persons or employees actually. Um, and this is the nation as a whole, and this is LA and Orange County. And you know, you know, we hear about this all the time that it's difficult to do property development in Los Angeles, and of course it is, but this just brings home how unresponsive the housing market is to demand pressures. And this is why we think probably there's been some slowdown in growth in just, even this is all before the pandemic. There's been a slowdown in growth 
um, because it's just not possible to expand the economy without building more housing. And we're not building more housing. And this is, of course, on the governor's agenda that we have to build hundreds of thousands of units, a basically impossible goal in order to create more affordable housing. We're going to need all of that housing in order to, you know, um, continue the growth that we're, that we're used to. Um, and so I thought I had, you know, oh, I guess maybe I deleted. I had some, some more micro data on the housing prices for Orange County as well. Maybe it's later on. But then the pandemic hit. And I think this is interesting, and it, it just, it just um, reinforces some things that William said, which is that the, the Orange County actually suffered the, the beginning of the pandemic more than the U.S. economy as a whole. So this is total employment. And again, it's normalized to, in this case, January of 2020 at 100. And so you look at the first few months of the pandemic, and Orange County got hit significantly harder than the U.S. economy as a whole. So if you look at this, this is about 84. So that tells you that Orange County lost 16% of its employment from January to April of 2020. The U.S. got hit hard, but it was more like, um, you know, 14%, 13% um, decline in employment. And while the U.S. economy, at least U.S. employment, started to recover almost immediately after that, the Orange County employment figure fell one more time from April to May, then started to recover. But the pace of recovery is lacking and we have definitely not caught back up to uh, US uh, rate of growth. The unemployment rate is higher. It was more or less the same in March and April, but then shot up above the national unemployment figure in May and has stayed above. And this is something that I think William pointed out as well. And it stubbornly has not come back to the US level. There is some convergence here, but not so much um, uh, after that. And it's kept on being, there's, there's this gap that remains and it's, it's, it's rather disappointing. So I wanted to delve into a little bit of why that was the case. Earnings remain strong. Um, and so that's, that's a bright spot. Oh, here's, <laughs> here's the, um, the micro data on house prices. And I just put this in just to show that there's been absolutely no break in housing prices, no matter what submarket of Orange County you're talking about. So this is just four zip codes that I pulled out of the Zillow data. And, but every zip code looks basically like this, that there's been just no change. This is uh, the bottom one here is a zip code from Garden Grove. This is one from um, Tustin. This is Huntington Beach and this is Laguna Beach. And this is always an outlier. It's just this huge, you know, ever, ever since the end of the recession. And growth in Laguna Beach housing prices has been nothing short of spectacular, but the rest of Orange County shows extremely steady growth as well. So it's, as, as Jerry said, um, there's been absolutely no break in real estate, uh, residential real estate prices. Um, and housing starts have recovered a little bit, but they're still abysmally low. So so that's, so that's where we've been, okay? The, the Orange County economy is vigorous, but reaching some supply constraints, then the pandemic hits and we do worse than the, than, the, than the broader US economy. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about why that's probably the case. Um, I think the most important thing here to remember is that what we're experiencing is not a recession in the classic sense. The, the, the economy was very strong and there was no overheating of the economy in February of 2020. Normally recessions, what are they caused by? They're caused by inflated asset values, bubbles, which burst, right? So this is the great recession. This is the tech recession of the early 2000s. Uh, there's liquidity problems. We did not have that in, in the beginning of 2020. The way to think about the pandemic in all of its awfulness, as well as when you're thinking about the economics of it, is that it's a, it's a natural disaster. It's not a recession, it's a sudden shock 
to the to the economic system. That's that. So there's no none of the classic problems of recessions like liquidity. It's you know a, a, a breakdown almost in the normal economic way of life. It's, so think of it again in its awfulness and its human toll. It's like a hurricane. It's like a very bad earthquake or some other natural disaster. And so the way to the way to approach it, of course, as a matter of policy, is to treat it like a natural disaster. And what do we do in disasters? Well, we bring relief to the affected people immediately. We do it quickly in order to mitigate the negative consequences of it. And, and we've done that. We, we have the CARES Act. We have what I'm calling here mitigation and shelter markets, which in in, in a natural disaster means getting people shelter that's been destroyed. Here it means um, rent relief, it means uh, anti-eviction um, policies. Um, uh, it means it, it can mean other things, but those are the two that I'm thinking about. And those are good things because we don't want to kick people out of their homes uh, while there's a pandemic uh, uh, afoot. And so that's, I, th I think those are temporarily good things. I don't think they should be permanent by any means, but as a, as a temporary measure to deal with what we're dealing with, I think those are really good policies. So I can't help but advertise some of my own research, which was not pandemic inspired. Uh, some, some friends of mine from uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas and I did a study of how economies, local economies react to negative economic shocks. And in the, the case we're looking at is hurricanes, and we ask the question, how quickly, we know that economies can recover from natural disasters like hurricanes, but how long does it take? And what are the characteristics of economies that recover more quickly than others? And so we did this study and it was actually just published. And so I'm very proud of that. But um, we, we settled on, um, diversity of the industrial base as being a key element of how quickly economies can recover. So you think about New Orleans and you think about Miami or some other Florida city that's been hit by a hurricane. There's a rule of thumb in, in disaster economics, I guess you call it, that natural disasters take two years on average for economies to recover from. So you get hit by Hurricane Andrew or Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane uh, Sandy, there's a negative supply shock, a negative demand shock to the economy. Um, and now, and then recovery begins, but the, but the speed of that recovery is gonna depend on what kind of industries you have. And if you're totally dependent on certain industries, and I guess we're thinking of tourism, but if you're totally dependent on certain industries and those industries get hard hit, again, tourism is a natural uh, example here, it's gonna take you longer. And um, so we measured diversity by some usual measures. If, if you know, if you've taken economics, it's the Herfindahl index. Um, but it just basically asks, you know, how reliant are you on one particular industry? How broad based is your economic um, uh, in industry base? And you can see from this map, we have measures of diversity for the largest air, largest cities in the, in the US and red means you're more diverse and green means you're less diverse. And so there's some very undiverse economies out there in Las Vegas as as William pointed out, Las Vegas is a very undiverse economy because what 25% of its employment base is in hospitality and tourist based industries. And that's a lot. Um, so you can see that, so what the study found was that those cities that had diversified industrial bases recovered twice as quickly. So if you were you know, a standard deviation above average in your diversity measure, 
you could recover from a natural disaster in one year rather than two years. And if you're very undiverse, if you're very concentrated, it would take you longer, three years, maybe longer. So you can see, so what I take away from this from the pandemic is, is if we think about the pandemic as a, as a, um, as a, uh, as a, as a natural disaster rather than a recession, then we can gauge how long it's going to how long it's going to take for individual regional economies to return to normal. And so, so Orange County, it's a little bit small here, but you can see that it's slightly better than average um, in its diversity. So it, I, I'm optimistic about Orange County being able to recover slightly faster because it's got this robust, diverse economy. Yes, we rely on tourism, but we're not overly reliant on tourism the way Las Vegas and Honolulu are. Um, so it's, it's a relatively diversified industrial base, but it's not super diversified, but it's better than average. And yet it did slightly worse than average in the first few months. So is that contradictory? No, it's because of our slightly more heavier reliance on tourism. So I was thinking about that and manufacturing. So here's, this is very similar to what uh, William showed us. Here's not percentage change, but the actual level of employment in leisure and hospitality in Orange County. And you can see that it's very large, but not, you know, it's, we're not over reliant on tourism. But when a particular industry gets hit as hard as the tourism industry did in Orange County, it's going to have an effect. And it did. And that's why we did worse uh, coming out, coming into this pandemic than some other uh, areas. And so for, just for comparison purposes, I put manufacturing on here as well. And you can see that manufacturing is an important part of the, of the Orange County economy, but the percentage drop is much less. What's interesting here, if you can see this, this yellow is the pandemic era, manufacturing hasn't come back at all in Orange County, whereas it has in the broader economy. Um, and tourism's come back, but not nearly enough to, um, you know, to get back to its original trend. So again, this is just repeating what William said, which is that, you know, it might take some time so just for comparison purposes, I put another couple of sectors on here. Again, this is repeating a little bit what William did. Um, so in the top is construction. You can see that construction had a very tiny um, reaction to the initial, uh, in the initial months of the pandemic and has recovered pretty well, not completely. Here's warehousing and transportation, and I think utilities is in there as well. And that's basically had no impact. I mean, there's this kind of normal noise in the data, uh, but it's basically come back completely. So it's really, this is just trying to emphasize the point that it's really uh, leisure and hospitality tourism sector that's really driving what's happening during this uh, unfortunate period. Um, so to conclude this part, Orange County has a lot going for it that other places don't. And most obvious ones are the amenities that it has, including the fact that we're in this lovely geography with great climate and great shoreline, but also in man-made amenities, stuff to do, places to go, things to see, and that's all great. And so I'm, I'm very optimistic about the, the medium to long-term um, uh, economic forecast. I don't have a formal forecast here, but Orange County is always going to be a great attractor for both enterprises and for people. And what we need to worry about is that supply constraints don't get in the way. And they need not constrain us as much in the past. We need more enlightened zoning and more, you know, basically more building in order to continue the growth that, that we have. Um, and I, if, if you're worried about property values, I'm going to say don't worry about your property values because um, basically there's just elastic demand. If I can use a, an economics term, there's elastic demand for living in Orange County. And if prices start to slide a little bit because of increased supply, more people are going to move here. 
Um, Jerry, we were a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, I can keep, I was, that's, I've used up my 25 minutes. Do you want me to keep going? Uh, so, sure, we're a little ahead of schedule. We've got another five minutes if you'd like, or uh, we can take questions as well. Um, I got some, I've got data on commercial property. Um, I can show people that can take five minutes. Sure, let's take a look at that and then um, we'll get to the questions during the break. Okay, all right. So, so um, our friends at Cushman and Wakefield, if somebody's from Cushman and Wakefield in the audience, thank you for making your reports uh, public. Um, it's great, I use them in class all the time. So here's the industrial sector. You can see that it's pretty robust, uh, very low vacancy rates and, and rent, asking rent levels that are holding steady. Um, there's still uh, uh, some negative absorption here, but um, the picture that we have of industrial uh, real estate uh, is, is very good as it is for the whole country. Um, the constraint as always with expanding sectors in Orange County is availability. But if you read the papers, you know that there was a major deal done by Amazon to buy the old uh, OCR uh, print shop. Um, that's Mike, that's a friend of the UCI uh, Center for Real Estate, Mike Hera, who sold this property just a few days ago to Amazon for $63 million. And they're gonna turn it into a logistic center. And it seemed like a high price to pay for, for a building that they're gonna to have to turn down, but the location's wonderful. Um, and there's just not a lot of, of, of space like this left in Orange County within the, ur with the suburban urban core. You would think that they would have had to build this out in the outskirts of, of, the, of the area, but this came available and they snapped it up. Here's the office sector and here's, here's where the trouble spots are. We know that um, the office sector nationally is in trouble uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, and you can see that in Orange County, the negative absorption is just tremendous. Basically what this means is that people are giving up, entities are giving up their leases and nobody's taking up the space. Uh, basically construction in the office sector in 2020 so far is basically zero. Vacancy rates are way up, but this is just, this is not Orange County specific. This is just um, what's happening in the office market because we now realize that, um, you know, we can do at home a lot of what we used to do in the office. Whether those trends are gonna continue, I don't know. There's all kinds of things that have to happen before this is a permanent shift. I won't go through the details here. Here's the retail sector uh, again, it's a sector that seems like it's in trouble in the Orange County area, negative absorption, basically people giving up their leases again without anybody filling the space. Construction is basically zero. Uh, vacancy rates are way up um, and, uh, and asking rents are falling, though they're not falling by a tremendous amount. That may be because uh, the composition of the vacant stock has gotten higher. Um, I mean, I'm pretty, Actually, I'm pretty optimistic about retail in Orange County just because there's a lot of people here with a lot of high incomes. And you, when you talk to the real retail developers, they seem pretty bullish, uh, even, there's, even though there's a lot of headwinds um, in the retail sector. Uh, again, there's some details there, but I don't need to go through those. Um, and that's, I'm just repeating the, the, the points I made before. It's not a typical recession. And recovery can be swifter as virus mitigation takes hold to reiterate one of Jerry's points. And then um, our slightly higher than average diversity may mean a slightly uh, quicker recovery, particularly given the assets that we're starting with. So that's, that's my presentation. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Ed. That was uh, really insightful and informative and uh, you know, gave us some hope, but also, um, there's some realism as to what's happening in Orange County. Um, so we are now at uh, 2.09. Uh, it's break time until 2.20. But I have a few questions here that uh, came in on Slido. And so during this break time, uh, I'll go ahead and address the questions. And uh, if any of my colleagues here would like to 
jump in with answers, even answers that are very different from mine, please do. Uh, so the first question is international tourism is way down. Do you have a sense of how much tourism in Orange County is domestic versus international? How about in California or for the US overall? Uh, so some, something of a sense. So California is host to 25% of all international tourists in the US. It is uh, third only to Florida and New York in that regard. Uh, and California in 2018 hosted 1.5 million tourists from China. So that gives you a sense of, of maybe how large it is. Uh, obviously not all of the international tourists came from uh, China. Tourists from Mexico tend to be the largest group. Uh, you know, what proportion of the tourists to Orange County uh, that might be? Uh, so I've heard different numbers, but maybe about 15%. But when we're talking about this in terms of tourism, uh, I think you have to keep in mind that while foreigners are not coming to the US, Americans are not going to foreign countries. And so we do have some uh, substitution of American tourists for foreign tourists. So exactly what that uh, loss is, uh, is kind of an open question. In our forecast, uh, we just use that to slow down the rate of growth of leisure and hospitality uh, in California. Uh, anyone else uh, in the panel have a thought on that one? Okay, hearing none. Uh, so this question is, are we now getting inflated asset values, equities, and home prices that might lead to a recession? So let me take equities first. Uh, of course, the uh, equity markets kind of flattened out after an increase. Uh, that increase was partially just liquidity chasing yield, uh, but uh, you know they soared today and uh, equity prices are a bet on the future value of, of companies, not just where they are today. It doesn't look like those equity prices are in bubble range because they've been going kind of up and down and responding to news. I think the last was they're up about 800 points today on the Dow. Uh, and if you look at what has uh, increased equity prices. They're mostly being driven by tech, not entirely, but, but at least somewhat. And our expectation is that tech is going to do very well. So that's what you would uh, think is gonna happen with equity prices. Interestingly, uh, in that 800 uh, point increase today, Netflix is actually negative. So the equity markets are really reflecting uh, a belief based on uh, the Pfizer announcement today and uh, the COVID task force that was announced today that this pandemic is gonna get under control and the economy is uh, going to be on a good growth path. Uh, so I think they may uh, be you know, much more favorable towards our forecast or perhaps uh, an even faster expansion. Uh, let's see, we have one here. Uh, oh, and I didn't address housing. Uh, I think as Ed expressed, uh, you know, especially for Orange County, there's a shortage of housing, not, a, uh, not an excess of housing. And the reason why home prices are so high in Orange County is Orange County is a great place to live. And so there's a lot of demand there. There are people who will move closer to work and move into Orange County. If you get, uh, you know, even some marginal changes in home values, so that certainly does not seem to be a bubble there or elsewhere in California. Uh, we are just not expecting uh, to see home prices plummet. To see that as a bubble that's uh, sitting there waiting to pop. Uh, related to housing, Jack Skelly asks: uh, Housing demand remains strong, but permits are far from keeping up. How does that choked off sales activity impact 
the housing industry. Uh, you know, it basically says uh, if home prices are holding up and home demand is, uh, you know, clearly driving that, that uh, builders can make a business plan that, that pencils out, uh, particularly if the state and local uh, governments make it easier, uh, make it less costly to build. Uh, we're seeing some of that, so we're expecting uh, actually an increase in home building. That does not mean that California is going to move down that affordability index much, if at all, uh, but we are expecting increased building. Uh, and then another question on housing, do you think construction will lag other industries in the recovery? Uh, we think construction is going to be one of the leading industries. It'll be construction and technology uh, and at least the freight part of logistics that are going to lead this recovery. Uh, Patricia uh, asked or commented, another natural disaster hitting us are wildfires. How do you see that impacting housing real estate? Uh, some can no longer afford or obtain insurance policies. So that's a, a great question. Uh, you know, with some exceptions, and, and, and Santa Rosa seems to be one of those exceptions, uh, the wildfires uh, have been impacting housing that is in the uh, urban wilderness interface. And, uh, and that's where, uh, where fire insurance is now being questioned by the insurers. You see the same kind of thing with flood insurance along parts of the Gulf, uh, where the, the increase in hurricanes is making that much riskier for insurance companies. Uh, so, uh, you know, impacting it in two ways. One is, uh, you know, the housing production that we have, part of it just goes to rebuild homes that, um, homes that have been lost in these wildfires. Uh, so uh, every home that is lost means a step backwards in uh, an increase in the housing stock uh, in, in California. So even though we have an increase in home construction in our forecast. It is mitigated uh, by these wildfires. And the second is I think that you're gonna see uh, less building in this uh, urban wilderness interface, even though it is a really nice place to live, it's uh, you know apparently becoming a riskier place to live. Uh, so I think that's, that's the answer to that. Um, and then let's see. One more. So I asked this question just to get us started, but I'll ask it of myself. Uh, why don't I think there would be much change in economic policy in 2021 with the new administration? And, and the, the answer is twofold. One is that the budget and authorizations have, are already in place. And, uh, and historically, the first year of a new administration does not have a lot of change in economic policy. And when the Obama administration started, you saw a stimulus package come in and uh, some aggressive policies to stem the downturn in the recession. But many of those policies, you know, uh, mirrored, they were larger but they mirrored some of the things that the George W. Bush administration was doing. Uh, again, you know, the, it's very hard to turn it around. Uh, there are a number of things that uh, the Biden administration has said they want to accomplish. And so we're not expecting uh, much in the way of a change in economic policy, in fiscal policy, uh, simply because the, of the constraints that have been uh, put on with very high deficits and the uh, stimulus packages that already exist. And I think that we got to the end of the questions. Yes, so, um, so if you have questions in the second part, go ahead and put them in Slido. I'll answer them in the chat 
but uh, or or we can ask them if they're of the panel. We have a Q and A time frame at the end, and uh, and so the the uh, panel can take those questions on. We're at two twenty. Welcome back, and let's begin the second part of our program. Uh, and for the second part of our program, uh, we have with us. Uh, Douglas Duncan. So Doug Duncan is Senior Vice President and Chief Economist at Fannie Mae, where he's responsible for forecasts and analysis of the economy and the housing and mortgage markets. Uh, Doug also oversees strategic research regarding the potential impact of external factors on the housing industry. And he leads the House Price Forecasting Work Group, reporting to the Finance Committee. Uh, Doug received his PhD in agricultural economics from Texas A&M, a bachelor and master's degree in agricultural economics from North Dakota State University. Uh, and he has been senior vice president and chief economist at the Mortgage Bankers Association amongst other positions. Uh, Doug was not able to attend in person, uh, but we caught up with him earlier this week and uh, recorded his remarks. So, George, if you want to take it away, and there we go. Well, welcome to UCLA, Doug. Uh, it's uh, nice to have you here, however, virtually. And actually, we usually do this on the campus of UC Irvine, so welcome to Irvine. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we are the day before the election, so uh, when this shows, uh, all things might be different, uh, but I think the housing markets are probably not, and and uh, we are delighted that you're here with us to share your insights on what's happening in housing markets. So with that, let me turn it over to you to uh, bring up your slides and... Uh, okay. Proceed. Great. With the type all right. Software. Thank you. Um, thanks for the invite to, um, to Irvine. Um, this virtual trip will probably be less uh, expensive than the last trip I took to Irvine when I bought a couple of pieces of art. So uh, this, uh, this will be more economically efficient, perhaps, <laughs> although I'm enjoying the art. <laughs> um, so uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to, to join you. And I'll start with a few comments on the macro. Uh, environment when, and my understanding is that we're a little more optimistic than the uh, than the Anderson School is, um, but let me uh, let me talk about the um, <clears throat> the our, about our outlook and um, I'll characterize it the way that I've been characterizing it to our uh, board of directors, and that is uh, that. Given that the driver from our perspective is not an economic value variable, but it's a health variable, the, the changes in the economy depend uh, on the response of uh, people, businesses, and policymakers to the incidence, duration, and severity of the disease. And we're certainly not medical experts. Uh, and are dependent on the medical experts who are still learning about the disease themselves. And so we, what we really characterize our forecast is, is our base scenario. And you can envision another scenario pretty easily with the, the, the return of the virus and some lockdowns, for example, in Europe. Uh, some people are questioning whether the, the, a better scenario would be a double dip scenario. And I think uh, comparing uh, forecasts, that's a key thing that you have to determine is what is the, what's the view about the impact of the, of the virus on behaviors of those, of those entities. So if you take a, a thousand foot look at our uh, forecast, uh, what you see is between the end of 2019 and the end of 2021, uh, we basically have zero real economic growth. They're very close to no economic growth. We have a downturn in 2020 and 2021, we capture that. But 
a period of two years of no growth suggests that if the, uh, the pool of employees grows, unemployment will rise. And so what you see is that the unemployment rate at the end of 2021 in our forecast is not quite double what it was at the end of 2019. So that two years of net, very little growth uh, will of course see an increase in unemployment. Now that's from a historically low level. Nonetheless, it still involves a lot of people and a lot of economic damage in the, in the interim. So what I've done something a little different here. Most of the uh, forecasts uh, comment on uh, the annualized quarterly growth, for example. So what we've done is uh, take out the annualization and actually look at the change in real GDP averaged, uh, I mean, uh, totaled on each quarter. So what you see is through the year of 2019, we uh, averaged uh, around 110 or between 100 and 110 billion dollars added to GDP each quarter. Then January and February were positive, but, the, but March when the COVID really hit full force was sufficiently negative to make, uh, our, to make a decline in our national income in the first quarter of 2020. And then it accelerated very rapidly and very severely in the second quarter. Now, in the third quarter, it appears we will have recaptured the most of that decline, but certainly not all. Uh, and then our forecast is that we will see continued additions to, uh, to GDP uh, each of the next quarters through the end of 2021. We took a look back to World War II to see how many quarters actually had we had real economic growth and it's about 250 quarters. And they averaged about $75 billion addition to our GDP on a quarterly basis. In that same time period, we had 43 quarters of recessions, which averaged about $79 billion of decline in GDP but fortunately about five times as many quarters of growth as, uh, as of decline. Wanted to give you just a little bit of a historic context uh, in which to put those quarterly numbers in context. Next slide, please. And of course, key to the housing sector is what's going on with employment. So what I've done here is uh, to give a, a sense of the last, uh, all of those post-World War II expansions that I just uh, was referencing the quarterly growth rates on. And um, starting at the uh, start of the recession is at zero. That's the level of employment at the beginning of that recession. Then you see the decline in employment, the percentage of job losses relative to that peak, and then the length of time it took to get back to that same pre-recession level of employment. A couple of things to notice here. One is the, the, the COVID-induced decline is by far the most severe. Uh, the, it is V-shaped to the, to the extent that you hear people use those the alphabetic things, but that's only for a time period. We, don't, we now think that the recovery back to peak employment will slow, as I noted in, in our macroeconomic forecast. What is no, another thing that is notable is if you look at the last four expansions, what you see is it has taken an increasingly long time to get back to the, to the peak uh, of pre-recession employment. So we wonder whether or not there's some fundamental that will, will mean we will take longer in this, uh, this recovery to get back to the, uh, to the peak employment uh, pre-recession because of the unusual nature or if it will behave somewhat differently, uh, both because of the unusual nature and because of the, the policy response. Next slide. The, the one thing I would say in the employment space is that this is a loss of employment heavily conditioned on the, the discretionary spending by above average income households. So you think of major sporting events, concerts, theaters, airlines, hotels. These are a, a, a lot of the uh, demand in that space is discretionary demand paid for by higher income households. But the workers in those positions are 
more heavily hourly wage workers. Um, and that's important to the housing sector in that the hourly wage workers are more heavily concentrated in rentals where you're hearing things like uh, eviction for, uh, moratoria and things like that versus among homeowners, which is a more heavily salaried uh, position. So I'll talk a little more about that when I talk about housing. Next slide. The policy response to all this was, in my mind, very rapid at the national, at the federal level. There was a, a very significant response, both by the central bank and by the Congress and the White House. Irrespective of the fact that this is an election year, the CARES Act was passed quite rapidly in the programs uh, according to historical uh, timing. And the programs were put in place quite quickly. Uh, that was rather impressive. Now, some of the provisions have been expiring and there's been a lot of uh, discussion and controversy about that. Nonetheless, nonetheless, at the outset, transfer payments as a share of personal income skyrocketed as a result of the policy before starting to wane. You also then saw the savings rate skyrocket, uh, and um, but uh, has also been coming down as uh, uh, consumption has picked up. So next slide. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump past this uh, because I know you just had a talk on uh, macroeconomics, and the thing I would point out before we leave this uh, table is that bottom line, the expectation of the what's gonna happen with the 10 year treasury. That's the base pricing for the mortgage industry. Mortgages are typically a spread above the 10 year treasury. Um, in part, it's measured that way because uh, in periods of uh, longer, or uh, some people would say normal economic growth, um, the, the um, Tenure, the, the, refin the period in which people stay in their home is around seven to 10 years before they move up to another home or down to a different home. And so the tenure treasury tends to be a pretty good measure of what's a base for the spreads in the mortgage space. Next slide. Now, I remember sitting at my desk, next slide, sitting at my desk uh, in June of 2003 and watching intraday trading in the 10-year treasury. And it hit 3.08%. And I remember thinking to myself, will I ever see a time period when the 10-year treasury will be below 3%? So as you saw on that chart, we've been below 1% for some time and we expect that will continue. Federal Reserve in their most recent uh, release of the thoughts of the governors uh, show that the bulk of them don't believe there'll be a change in the Fed funds target from its current range of zero to 0.25% out until the end of 2023. We'll see whether that happens. There's been some rise in the 10 year treasury recently. Uh, speculation is on wh whether it's one of two things. There may be other factors as well. One of them being whether the belief is that there will be a uh, stimulus package that will pass as soon as the election passes, either in the lame duck se session or in the, uh, the uh, term of the, the uh, next president, whether it's the incoming administration and the incoming new administration or a continuation of the current administration, that there would be some form of stimulus that would be passed. Alternatively, there could be the view that given the supply side destruction uh, through small business failure, if there is that uh, stimulus, that that could actually be inflationary as it stimulates uh, demand in the presence of constrained supply. So recently the tenure has moved up a little bit, but it's not yet even above the 1% level. Next slide. So one of the things that has, uh, it, it is a result of this very, this long period of very low interest rates and what we expect will be a continued period of low interest rates, particularly in the mortgage space is uh, if you look at the, the uh, mortgage payments as a share of uh, quarterly disposable income, we are at over 40 year lows in terms of the amount uh, that households which own homes are committed uh, of their budget 
to paying for uh, paying for their housing. It's one of the reasons that that you're seeing uh, house prices being bid up is that very low interest rate uh, and the uh, the benefit that comes in terms of the size of payments. This is hugely beneficial to people who are currently homeowners. No question about that. And you can see huge volumes of refinancing taking place, which we'll talk about. Uh, I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. But it's also the case that the uh, consumer debt service, uh, including other forms of debt like auto loans and uh, credit cards, uh, home equity loans, uh, are also at lower levels than they've been for uh, 15 or, or more years. So this has been a very, um, in terms of the share of the household's budgets that have to be committed to debt payment, um, that has uh, fallen as a result of the decline in uh, interest rates. Next slide. So one of the things that uh, that came up when the uh, when the COVID uh, first became apparent to be a significant factor was how far house prices would fall. So in April at our the Fannie Mae board meeting, the, that was a question that came up and we said, well, it's our view that house prices will rise. And they uh, asked for an explanation of that given that uh, most of the public discussion was on how far house prices would fall. And from a Fannie Mae perspective, house price is a very important variable in understanding the financial performance of the company. So we said, well, for one thing, we've been talking since probably 2014 about the biggest problem in the housing sector in the single family market is the uh, slow recovery of supply. And in fact, our view is today, we are probably still somewhere in the 200,000 unit annual production lower than what current demographics would suggest. That's been the case for some time. So that's not even just a, a fixed number of catch up, that's an annual production estimate. So we said, if, the, if it is still true that there is a supply constraint relative to the level of demand growth, then um, you would expect house prices to fall. So the question in the COVID environment is, will demand fall as far or further than supply? And as it turned out, um, we have some data uh, that I'll show you in a moment from our national housing survey that shows that it was the supply side that fell further and house prices have risen. Before we leave this chart of starts, you do see in the 2018 time period when there was some tightening underway in the Fed that that rise in interest rates led to a decline in housing production until it was reversed in 2019, and then the production rose again. So there, one of the things that is worth noting about that is if there were a, a burst of inflation expectations that, and that drove rates up fairly fast, uh, even 100 basis points in six months, you would expect a decline both in uh, housing production uh, and in the level of sales in the marketplace. So there will be some sensitivity, particularly as we've been through a period of very long period of very low interest rates. So that is at least a short-term risk consideration. And um, the, it is worth thinking about in light of the fact that the Fed has uh, shifted to their targets uh, it, it, on inflation from a, a ceiling to an average. So what I tell people is your inflation fate is now in their hands, but fate is F-A-I-T, flexible average inflation targeting. Uh, so um, there is a question about if they're willing to allow inflation to overshoot their long-term target of 2%, how far, how fast, there's still things for them to clarify on that front. Nonetheless, you can see the pattern of, of production and the impact of rates there. Next slide. So uh, this is just a little bit of a, a couple of markets in California, LA, San Jose, and San Francisco, just to give a sense of the number of housing starts and a little bit of comparison back to the 
2008-2009 downturn. And you can see the slow growth over the next few years in supply, particularly of starts, particularly in the Los Angeles area. You can see the dramatic drop off in, uh, in starts in that market um, before a little bit of rebound. So still some, some distance to go in uh, these three uh, markets, although um, San Jose is back pretty close to the, to the average of the last say uh, 10 years or so. Next slide. Now inventory, as I said, the question is what matter, what was the balance between supply and demand? And the supply, the inventories of existing homes are at the lowest since they've been reported. They're uh, at about three months of supply. A more normal is probably in the five month uh, area. Uh, that is the number of months it would take to exhaust the supply of homes listed at the current sales pace. Um, so very low levels. Uh, on the uh, new homes, that uh, supply has been coming down because they've been, builders have been selling everything that they could build uh, and are going to have to rebuild uh, inventory to keep up with the pace of demand. Next slide. Another quick look at, um, uh, the, uh, those three same metros in California. And you can see that the, the uh, listings uh, of, the, of existing homes uh, have uh, rebounded in the uh, past uh, month, uh, month and a half, uh, I'm sorry, month or two, uh, and back to above the, um, the uh, um, into positive, ter positive territory for recognizing an increase in listings. Uh, and the US as a whole has not quite gotten back to that. So California has done a little better than the US as a whole on the rebound in the listings subsequent to the, to the COVID. Uh, next slide. So this comes from our national housing survey um, and uh, we produce something called the, the Home Purchase Sentiment Index. And in that, we ask a series of questions. Um, is it, a, for example, a bad time to buy or a bad time to sell? And you can see a much stronger response on a bad time to sell than you see on the bad time to buy. Our conclusion in looking into the reasons that were cited was that those folks who had a home they could list for sale, they were already a, an existing homeowner, were asking the question, do we really want someone with COVID to come walking through our house and looking at it as a prospective customer? Or because of the COVID, will they even go and shop? And what's the risk that we would take a price that's not reflective of the market because of this disruption that the virus has called, caused? However, those who were in the market to buy a home we're, suge we're suggesting, while that may be true, interest rates are at historically low levels, and this would be a great time to be able to, to buy a home and lock in uh, long-term debt payments at very low interest rates. So that imbalance between the response of those on the supply side and those on the demand side led us to believe that house price appreciation would be strong, especially in light of the, uh, of the continued new production at levels that were below what demographics suggested would be, um, would be appropriate. Next slide. So what you see when you look at uh, mortgage application data uh, is that, that the demand side of the equation is running very strong uh, relative to the, uh, the past couple of years. Uh, not surprising in that interest rates uh, are at the lowest that they've uh, been in modern times. Uh, today, good quality credits can get mortgages certainly under 3%. Uh, if you're a very high quality with a significant down payment, probably two and three quarters percent. We actually think that uh, for the year of uh, 2021, that mortgage rates will average somewhere in the 27 to 2.8% range across the course of, of that year. Obviously, given my comments earlier about scenarios, 
what happens in the election, what happens as a result of the virus, uh, whether there's the, uh, the emergence of an effective broad-based uh, vaccine, all of those can impact the scenario that you would paint for where uh, economic activity and interest rates might go. But our current forecast is that there will be sub 3% mortgages uh, for the year of 2021. Next slide. So existing home sales have rebounded um, uh, as have uh, new home sales both. Uh, and uh, there was a little bit of a, of a uh, backup in new home sales uh, in September, but still at very high levels. Um, so consumers are definitely in the market, uh, taking advantage of those very low interest rates and the, the work of the builders to try to get supply to the market and some rebound in listings from those uh, who have existing homes for sale. Next slide. Looking, uh, this, these are second quarter data, so they don't contain uh, all the third quarter data yet, but uh, looking again at those three, uh, at those three markets, you can see the decline in existing home sales that aligns with what our, uh, our national housing survey suggested where the attitude of uh, those uh, who had homes available to sell but chose not to, you can see the, the decline in actual sales that resulted as a result of those uh, folks not listing. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> of course, if um, demand grows faster than supply, price goes up um, and certainly has, price has been at very strong levels, but they've been at strong levels for some time relative to history uh, if you go all the way back to World War II, as I started with the GDP data, uh, and out to the year 2000, on average, adjusted for inflation, house prices rose about three quarters of 1%. They've been running well above that for five or six years. Uh, and the, uh, this uh, supply-demand imbalance during the COVID has actually accelerated that. We do think that the house prices will slow particularly if there is a, a, um, an effective vaccine that is produced and broadly based. We do think that you will then see listings pick up uh, and you will see uh, uh, house prices, house price appreciation slow uh, as a result of that, perhaps in the latter half of 2021. Uh, next slide. If you compare those house prices to household incomes, um, no surprise to uh, folks living in California uh, that the, the um, ratio of the median existing home sales price to median family income uh, is much higher than it is uh, in the, the country as a whole. And some of the, the metros uh, in like Los Angeles and um, uh, uh, San Francisco uh, uh, in, I guess, California as a whole uh, are much higher than uh, within, the, uh, within the U.S. Uh, across, average across the full U.S. Um, there are some of the markets in, in California that are pretty close to the, to the national average. For example, San Jose uh, is one of those. Next slide. <clears throat> So one of the questions um, uh, was whether or not fear from, uh, of the virus and living in densely populated areas would lead people to seek to move to less densely populated areas. So um, there is some evidence that that, that uh, has happened. However, um, uh, the question really is whether it's the acceleration of a pre-existing trend or it's a new long lasting uh, phenomenon. We think the jury is still out on that because if you were following the millennials, you will have seen that they've actually been moving away from the urban center for three or four years now. And clearly this has accelerated, uh, the, the presence of the COVID has accelerated that, uh, but as, We've learned more about the virus. 
you can see that the um, that the trend line is uh, falling back toward levels uh, pre-COVID. So will it be a long-term phenomenon uh, or is it simply the acceleration of a pre-existing phenomenon remains to be seen. And our thought is it probably depends on the metro area. This is more pronounced in places like, well, like um, New York City, uh, San Francisco, Boston uh, are three cities where it, it's quite pronounced and may be longer lasting. Next slide. This is uh, New York City and San Francisco giving a sense of moves within the metro and moves out of the metro. And you can see that uh, particularly uh, in New York City, both within and uh, out of the metro have been happening, whereas within, where, whereas not a lot of change in San Francisco about moves within, uh, within the metro. Next slide. So if you, if you, the, this is Mortgage Bankers Association data on delinquencies. This is serious delinquencies, 90 days or more delinquent by mortgage type. If you add into each of the mortgage types, the loans that go into for, that are in forbearance, what you see is a dramatic rise in the level of delinquency. Now, what we've seen within the company is, um, next slide, uh, is that um, there uh, were a number of people who took a forbearance because it was quite easy to, to uh, secure a forbearance, but they took it as a precautionary move. Um, oh, um, we'll jump past this slide. So um, as you can see here, 26% of the people that requested a, uh, a forbearance did so as a precautionary move. And another 23% suggested it was possible or that it was difficult, but in, and in some cases impossible to make their mortgage payments. So they also uh, took forbearance. Other reasons, uh, easy to get a mortgage relief plan, simply that you could you could get it with by calling and saying you had a hardship and you could get mortgage relief. One of the questions is uh, whether some of those folks were just saving the payment differences and would, will bring it current. Um, so there's a, there are a number of behaviors here which have actually seen the number of forbearances fall from peak levels. As some people, particularly those doing it as a precaution, are seeing that their employment is now stable uh, and are releasing the forbearance, uh, and having kept their mortgage current the entire time. Uh, next slide. One of the things that we, we list as a significant risk is for homeowners with mortgages. And you'll recall I said that the loss of jobs in that discretion, discretionary spending set of categories was heavily conditioned on employment uh, that was hourly wages. One of the risk factors related to that is if there is a resurgence of the virus, which seems to be underway to some degree anyway, that those uh, companies who have been able to continue and retain their salaried management workers, if they see a second wave of downturn in, uh, in demand, may have to in, close up shop uh, and that would mean laying off uh, salaried workers. So when in looking in the section here with homeowners with mortgages, employer went out of business and lost job is a very significant component. And so we worry about the small business sector and whether or not a second wave would bring down more small businesses, which would increase the losses in the uh, in um, those households uh, that have uh, mortgages. Next slide. So just to sum up, um, over the next two years, we see with interest rates being, uh, as I said, uh, right today and through next year being uh, sub 3%, still very good, um, very good market for mortgage credit. Um, that's going to support 
uh, home sales and starts, we expect that uh, you'll see uh, home sales will be up almost 22% this year, another something like 3% next year as builders are, are rebuilding supply. Uh, and existing home sales, um, we'll see they'll be pretty close to flat in 2020 compared to 2019, and then up, we believe, in 2021. Again, this is where scenario analysis comes in. If you see a resurgence of the virus and an unwillingness to list among existing uh, home sellers, you may see strong price appreciation, but not the increase in sales. Of course, that price appreciation is an offset to the interest rate benefit um, in terms of affordability. And so the dollar volume of mortgage production uh, will rise and certainly has risen, in fact, from a nominal dollar perspective in 2020, total mortgage production will be the highest that in history. 20, uh, 2003 was the previous record 3.8 trillion. Uh, this year we expect it to pass 4 trillion. Of course, adjusted for inflation, 2003 would still be the, the, uh, the greater, but in nominal dollars, uh, 2020, likely the largest year in history. 2021 still a very big year, uh, but uh, significantly smaller on the refinance side as those households who are in the money to refinance take advantage of that in uh, in 2021 uh, 20, uh, or 2020 and 2021. So with that, I think I'll uh, I'll end my comments and uh, turn it back. Thank you, Doug. Uh, that was uh, really interesting and a great backdrop to what's happening in Orange County. Uh, and, and I think one thing that you pointed out uh, really succinctly with the data is that most recessions uh, involve a downturn in housing and a steep downturn in housing. And we often say this time is different and we're often wrong when we say that, but this time certainly is different. And that is uh, clearly good news in the housing and real estate space, good news for uh, the real estate sector in Orange County. So uh, on behalf of UCLA and all of our guests today, uh, I want to thank you for joining us and sharing uh, this deep dive into what's happening in housing markets in a COVID economy. My pleasure. Thanks very much for the invitation and uh, stay safe and uh, um, uh, appreciate the time spent. Thank you. Okay, I'm back and you saw that I quickly teleported from just outside of UCLA now to just outside of the Paul Mirage School of Business at UC Irvine, one of the advantages of uh, being virtual. Uh, the last part of our program, and you're going to want to stay around for this, is uh, going to be a look at what's happening in real estate in Orange County uh, from those who are actively involved and engaged in business, in the business of real estate. So let me turn it over right now to Tim Kawahara. Tim is the executive director of the Zyman Institute for Real Estate Studies at UCLA Anderson. And Tim, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, as Jerry mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Zyman Center for Real Estate at UCLA. Um, and we are truly delighted to co-host this virtual event along with the UCLA Anderson forecast. I certainly wish we could all be together as we have in the past with our physical host, UC Irvine. Uh, but hopefully with some of the good news about the vaccine today and the progress we're making that we, will, we can all be back together uh, next year and networking in person uh, on the campus of UCI. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the next segment of the program, uh, our industry experts panel. Um, you know, previous to this, we've heard a lot of macroeconomic data, a lot of charts, a lot of graphs. Uh, and so now our panel will extrapolate that down and provide sort of the street level perspective uh, for the greater uh, Orange County area. Um, I know you will find the conversation both interesting uh, and informative. We have a terrific group of panelists put together. Um, and with that, I would like to turn it over to our friend and moderator extraordinaire, 
uh, Eric Paulson, who is the CEO of Topside Real Estate uh, in Orange County, and he will lead the discussion with our esteemed panelists. Eric, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Can you see me and hear me all right? Yes, quite well. Thank you. Excellent. Good. Thank you. All right. So I've got my panelists. So I can't tell if my panelists are on board yet with myself, but uh, I have four panelists that are going to help us out here. So Kweku Jabba, are you on? Double checking. We on mute. Beth, is Kweku on? Looking for Kweku and Barbara Perrier and Christopher Tipri. Amanda yeah, we'll work, we'll work Barbara's on here. Chris is here as well. Spectacular. Just want to make sure we have all of our participants live and well. Should we go ahead and get started? Sure. It looks Take like Kweku is not signed in yet, but uh, we'll join the panel when he does. Spectacular. Why don't I go ahead and get started then, just because I know we all have limited time and uh, limited attention span. Uh, I will try and avoid introductions just because I know we have the ability to get those offline. So let's just go ahead and go straight into the discussion points. And I know most of you are probably a lot like me in that we are all going to stay up for uh, the New Year's this year. And it's not so much going to be able to uh, watch 2021 come in. It's just to make sure that 2020 leaves. Uh, it's been a fascinating year. Uh, I think there are definitely some winners and losers in this year, but what I want to try and have my panelists address is, is uh, there are definitely winners and losers. So what did we learn though in 2020? Uh, I think one of the points from our Fannie Mae speaker that was, was relevant was, you know, is this, was this a long-term change? Was this an acceleration, an acceleration of other events? So when I asked my panelists, what did we learn in 2020 about the markets, about our product types, and then what do we think will stick? What is now going to be in place going forward? Uh, you know, as an example, masks, are we wearing masks forever? That sort of thing. So Chris Tipri, I wanna start with you in regards to the office side, because I know office has been one of the more impacted product types. What did we learn about what's going on in 2020? Were we prepared for this? And in 2021, what is gonna stick around with it? I think the biggest question I've gotten and, and faced is is office dead and my my answer long lots of long short answers lots of uh, short term rentals for renewals for now but long term no it's not dead my our first indicator is actual real time activity so what we've been doing is uh, we fortunately hit stabilization at the boardwalk right before all of this hit I think I was at ninety percent as of the end of January. So I felt like it was a buzzer beater in the first couple of months and hit the hit, hit just what I needed to in order to, to pay all the bills and, and look like we were a success. Um, tenants pulled, the, pulled their foot off the gas for a couple months. And then all of a sudden, organizations realized that they still needed to utilize their office space and they still needed to have a footprint for collaboration, for driving culture and for creating a client experience. So, you know, I think Remote work has, has definitely been catapulted uh, uh, several decades into the future just by virtue of what we've all been doing. But I think that the, the work environment is, is still entirely necessary because I mean, I'm surprised at this point that my dogs haven't started barking and distracting me from, from whatever I was talking about. Uh, but other organizations are seeing that too. They've, all of our tenant, we've collected rent from all of our tenants uh, we've had a few requests for de rent deferrals or, or free rent, but a lot of it was just asking to ask. So we're 100% rent collected. We may have only 15 to 20% of pre-COVID traffic in the building, but we're still leasing space. I'm about to hit 95%, and we're, just, we're really just chipping away at it through spec suites. Our, our rents are where they were prior to COVID, if not a little bit higher. And I think that's maybe a testament to the quality of the building and some of the design features that we implemented. But uh, tenants are willing to pay for high quality space. And so we're still, we're still moving forward, even though maybe some of the, the older commodity space is, is doling out large free rent. 
NTI packages just to kind of achieve those short-term renewals. But so are I you think, seeing, have you seen, sorry to interrupt, Chris, are you seeing anything on the physical side that is going to stick around? Are we touchless forever? Are we, are we going to have to make modifications? Cause you mentioned commodity buildings. Most of Orange County is a 1980s built, probably a four story to six story uh, common elevators, common corridors. Are we going to have to go modify all that or not? My, so I'd say my, my crystal ball is as clear or fuzzy as yours, but some of the things that, so it's, it's hard to say long-term what, what the design is going to look like, but the demand that we've seen, the things that are really resonating with, with our occupants is pretty much like you said, touchless everything. So doors to enter the building, elevator dispatch, can you wave your key card or your fob in front of a, a, a reader and, and then go up straight to your floor without touching anything. And then, you know, everything in the restroom, you don't want to, you don't want to touch any of that. So that's big. We had, we implemented all of that throughout the project prior to. And so we just happened to be ahead of the curve by virtue of being a 2017 delivered building. We have MERV 15 filters. So upgraded air filtration and, and kind of air purges throughout the build number of times per day. Uh, and then I think the other, the other thing that's really big is enhanced cleaning and sanitizing, but not just cleaning, is making sure that the tenants see it, that they know that you're out there, that you're actually putting forth that effort. And some of that peace of mind goes a long way for right. everyone being happy and content in your environment. I could definitely see that. It used to be that you wanted to have the janitorial staff showing up at night when everybody was gone, but nowadays it doesn't hurt to have them cruising throughout the day. You see them making They're changes. wearing big, bright boardwalk shirts showing that they're a sanitizing <laughs> team and making everyone feel comfortable. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. A lot lower density, but for now, and we'll see how that translates. In the future. So, so Quaku, I probably stole thunder when I asked him about construction. Uh, I noticed you're still on mute, but I'm going to ask you: Are you seeing modifications going forward on the office side? Yeah, that's no, an interesting question, and and we are seeing some of that. And obviously, it depends, like you said, on which area your building was built in, right? Obviously, a lot of the newer product already has that baked into the design and was a feature that was already headed that direction. Uh, but we are hearing from clients in terms of things that are existing product that they're looking to move. And that's not just on office, that's on all kinds of product, including um, you know, arenas, stadiums, uh, venues, um, but definitely on office as well uh, as, we, as we go forward. So which, which product type is gonna have the biggest impact in construction changes from the norm, if you will? In terms of changes from the norm, I answer that in, in, from two directions. One, uh, I know we have some folks that really live in the industrial world here. And I think that just the demand, right, related to, uh, you know, the construction around uh, fulfillment centers and around the way to get products right to our door from the moment we say it out of our mouth until the moment it drops on our door to get that time span shorter and shorter. I think that that has an impact on the macro level. Um, I think that on the micro level, though, I definitely would say that uh, somewhere in both the spaces of retail, um, if you've been to South Coast Plaza recently and you've stood outside of a line just to get to your favorite store, um, there have to be adjustments, right, to that particular market in order to serve clients. And then also, secondarily, I think that the venue space, I think people are going to want to go back out uh, and not only dine, but go places and finding a way to do that in a COVID safe way. Uh, is going to be critical going forward for the markets that we look at. That makes some sense. And Barbara, I'm going to come to you on the industrial side because you segued you up perfectly. And then I'm going to go to Amanda on the retail side. Um, industrial is crushing it right now uh, in, in every single sense of the, of the term. Give me, give me, give us the quick 10 minute over, you know, 10 second overview, if you will, on why industrial is doing so well, where are we seeing things, we're seeing record cap rates. Talk to me about some of that. Give me the, give me the industrial speech. Well, so we've never seen the market quite so on fire as it's been. We're seeing cap rate compression. I think that's one of the only kind of uh, parts of CRE that you're seeing compression in cap rates this year. We've seen every kind of investor wanting to switch over. So we've seen retail developers who now want to become industrial developers, office investors that now want to invest in industrial. And I think it's just become kind of the new darling because of what's going on. Sorry, Chris and, and Amanda, but um, this is a fun year to be an industrial broker, I have to say. We've well, never I mean, been so busy. 
Um, but then one quick thing is when you look at what we're just talking about e-commerce, I mean, Amazon has leased 58.5 million square feet. That's 1.6 million square feet every week so far this year. And, you know, there's been 35 buildings that are over a million square feet. Amazon's half of those buildings. So, I mean, the amount of construction, the amount of new development, the amount of needs to kind of fulfill this. And, they, and the projection is this holiday season, there'll be more than 40% of all purchases online. And I, I bet you that turns out to be low because if this COVID thing spikes up, who's leaving their house? I mean, I know I'm trying to do my shopping online. So I think, you know, we're definitely the winner in this. So quick question then, I know at one point, it, well, let me back up. In the past, industrial buildings got scraped to build office, to build retail, to build multifamily. Now it seems like we're seeing other product types getting scraped to build industrial. So are you seeing land prices going way up? Are you seeing these conversions to something as basic as industrial going on? So land has never been quite as high. There's comps that are going on in the South Bay close to the port that are about hundred, you know, the 90 to hundred dollar per land foot, which is crazy. I mean, that just is a nutty number. Uh, Inland Empire is up in the 40 to $60 a foot, depending on where you are. I mean, we should have all been buying land in the Inland Empire a while ago. Um, I would tell you that, you know, there's a Costco down in South Bay that was shuttered and Amazon took that building. Um, so retail is definitely becoming, you know, kind of converted to industrial. Retail could be converted to multifamily. I mean, I think there's gonna be some changing of uses. And if you look at the price of industrial land versus other land types, we're probably at least double, but my, maybe more so, except for the multifamily space, depending on your density. And are you finding land? You, know, you are, you're tearing stuff down, like you mentioned, you're finding creative uses, but the entitlement process in California continues to get tougher and tougher. So entitled <laughs> land is, is like gold. Uh, I, we could tell a few stories over some cocktails of entitlement stories that would make everybody's hair curl, but we don't need to go there today. Yeah, we already can slam California enough without going into our entitlement process here. Yeah. Uh, well, Amanda, I've not forgotten you, I promise. All right. Hello there. Hello there. So how about this impact on retail? Is this an acceleration with defaults? Is this a, is this the exodus they're talking about? What do we got going on here? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously retail has been one of the hardest hit asset types. Uh, retail's not the darling of this changing economy. But um, we're going to start to see an increase in vacancy due to all the store closures that are happening um, Banana Republic, Forever 21, GNC, Steinmart. I think those are all, we're, we're gonna see those happening in Orange County. Uh, we also anticipate that rent growth will likely slow down, um, although maybe not as quite as much along the coastal cities, just due to the higher demand that's you know, along the beaches. Um, we are seeing a lot of retail tenants asking for rent relief. Landlords don't really have any alternative but to adapt to this. Um, so they are agreeing to defer rent anywhere from three months, six months, a year, just depending on how much the tenants are in financial distress. Um, and in order for landlords to recoup some of that lost rent, we're applying all the security deposits, we're applying letters of credit, we're saying, okay, you guys can pay us a letter of credit back um, over the course of the next year or two. Uh, they're also asking that during the rent deferral periods, if this already wasn't happening in the leases, to have the tenants pay a percentage of their revenues, um, have that applied toward rent. So there are different structures that, that landlords are working with tenants. You know, one, you could just defer rent completely Two, you can ask for a minimum rent, um, defer the rest, and three, this kind of hybrid of asking for a minimum rent plus a percentage of this gross revenue that they're, that they're making. Of course, for this structure to work, we bake in some reporting requirements and an audit right for landlords. So the tenants are required to deliver their financials on a month to month basis and the landlords are able to audit them um, just to make sure that everything's staying fair and the landlords are 
uh, you know, giving this right to the tenants who, who actually need it. Um, but retail owners are projecting a road to recovery. It's slow, but so long as tenants are allowed to continue to operate um, and you know, restaurants are adapting, they're projecting a road to recovery. It's just a little slower than others. Fair enough. So part, part of what I was going to suggest is if you're a landlord right now on a shopping center, yeah. you know, the expression is bad breath is better than no breath. So even if you've got a tenant that's struggling, there's nobody backing them up. So you need to work with this tenant. So uh, you, you covered a couple of things that you're seeing. Are you actually seeing any equity transfers in some of these business? In other words, is the landlord saying, hey, you may not be able to pay rent, but I'm going to take a, a piece of ownership of your, of your business um, and then we'll go forward together kind of to mitigate my bay. Are you seeing any of that happening right now or is it just kind of percentage rent and reduced rent? I have not seen that yet, That's, um, but maybe that is happening with more of the private investors. I could see that as a more uh, alternative for you know, your smaller landowners and private investors. But on the institutional front, I think we're just looking to recoup some of that and hope um, you know, the tenants don't go into more debt over the next few months to a year. Um, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you also uh, are focusing on some residential side of things too. So mm -hmm. uh, we've heard several conversations about the residential market with affordability, yeah. things of that nature. And I know uh, my wife's been working with you and has, has been doing purchase and sale contracts for a lot of residential land that's been taking place. Yeah. Where, where are we in the residential side? Are you seeing more construction coming? Are we, what, well, just, you're the expert, what's going on with residential land? Yeah, sure. And, and we just heard some, some uh, a great segment in the last hour, and that's pretty much, I'll just continue to allude to that, but home building, residential development, it's, it's quite unusual right now, you know, in an economic recession, we expect for residential development to slow down, um, but that's not happening. It's not happening here in Orange County, LA, um, Inland Empire, it's not happening nationwide. So land sales for residential development are up, moving quickly. Home builders are trying to produce product at a quicker rate. Um, of course, that requires permits and all of that good stuff. But uh, this high demand obviously is coming from record low interest rates. The fact that more folks are working from home and their children are learning remotely. So uh, with that, more folks are moving out of the cities. They're, they're looking to come to the suburbs for more space and less density. Um, so because the recession was not caused by the housing market, I, I think residential development will continue to do, do super well. Spectacular. Do you know about the pricing range they're building to? Is that anything you're familiar with? I mean, in Orange County, of course, it's a little higher than other areas, but uh, we, a lot of the home builders are still focusing on luxury townhomes, condos, single family. I think prices are, of, of course, increasing a little bit just due to the high demand um, and the low product at this time. Perfect. So we talk about construction. So I'm going to segue right over to you, Quaku. So the comment I've got for you is, with everything going on, with all of the various, you can't be on site, you have to be comfortable, you're an essential business, so you've been building. Have, have you been able to operate safely during this time period? And then two, does that increase my costs? And then three, as we're doing some of these distancing things, is that one where construction costs are gonna go up even more? So where are we on construction costs? Are we safely building right now? Are we seeing a shortage of labor? What's what's going on in the construction side? Sure, absolutely. And you know, we we do uh, not just as a saying, frankly, as uh, something that's vital to us is safety. Ultimately, it, it's a really a core value because it's the one thing, among others, that can halt construction if it's not being done well. And so, for the demand that you're hearing and seeing, you know, from our perspective, keep safety first. And what we're seeing is we've actually learned we can work safely. Uh, in the midst of a pandemic, you know, immediately when construction was deemed an essential industry early on, uh, the good news about that was that we were forced to practically overnight uh, take the skill sets we already had and come up with some mitigation strategies to keep people safe. And after working thousands of hours up and down the coast, some job sites with 800 plus people on them, 
Um, we've had very little, virtually no community spread on the job site, which means that there are cases where people have showed up to the site that had COVID, been around other people, and it was not spread among the site. Um, and that's because the workforce actually has been maintaining the protocols that our team has been leading. What we found is that there's a lot of interest there because people want to work, right? If you, are, if you have a family member right now that was in the hospitality industry and you live in the same home and your industry is essential and theirs is almost non-existent in some cases, and someone says, here's your job, you just have to follow this set of rules that we're imposing, um, we're seeing a lot of compliance on that side. Uh, so it's a combination, I think, of good leadership by our teams being forced to adapt and a willingness to work uh, from that of the workforce. What that so let, me, so let, me, let me interject with this one then. So then if you have, does that mean you have to spread out? Does that extend the construction time period now? Are you seeing an extension because of all this? Or are you still able to be safe in the kind of original time slot? Yeah, um, we're keeping similar time frames. Um, the time where it get, becomes a little bit constrained is when we're working on the finishes, the in, final interiors of a building where you would typically have multiple trades stacked on each other uh, that are working together in one space. The rest of it, we've been able to actually phase that well. And even in that interior space, it's now about organizing your work time frames to try to maintain those original schedules. So believe it or not, we haven't seen significant schedule impacts. We have absolutely had to adjust, uh, particularly as you get to the final finishes of a building to make sure that you can deliver those safely. Got it. And our costs going up, staying flat. What are we seeing? This is a, this is the, I always say this at the end because otherwise this, people won't stay for the rest of my comments, right? Our construction <laughs> costs going up. The only reason you, you thing you want to know on the panel, you know, on, on a serious note, um, right now, a couple of things that we look at in terms of determining that, right? If you think about a typical construction project, um, what happens is you've got just only a few inputs. You've got labor, you've got materials, right? Effectively, it's your two primary inputs. Then there's some kind of a fee for services. Uh, if you take a look at labor in Southern California, primarily a lot of labor contracts, a lot of consistency in terms of a constrained workforce. So we're not really seeing significant decreases in labor costs at this point, uh, whether it's because union agreements or whether it's just because of the demand in the market still, including housing that we just heard about. So then you go to materials, right? Well, some of our materials are produced here, but we've had a war on, you know, with, with you know, at least some words with some of the places where we have been relying upon driving material prices down. And so we're not necessarily seeing significant decreases in material pricing. Um, so what you will see is, I think, a slight uh, opportunity for a decrease here for maybe some part of the next year. And that's gonna be driven more so by subcontractors and suppliers that are trying to take work at a reduced fee to keep their doors open and keep people working. Uh, but the reality is the market isn't at a point where you're gonna see the kind of drops that people may expect. I think that it's going to be uh, just for the few quarters next year and only for those that have um, a constraint in terms of available workload. But if you look at what's happening in industrial, you look at what's happening in residential, um, I think if folks are hoping for some kind of 2010 type of an impact of a drop, that, that the, the inputs that affect pricing uh, aren't being adjusted in such a way to drive uh, that commodity down in that way. Perfect. And Barbara, on the industrial side, with all this growth that you're seeing from Amazon, and it's a, it's a different type of building per se. It's going to require more parking because they've got a lot of people in them. I, I think the most crowded parking lot I've ever seen was an Amazon fulfillment center. Uh, it was just chock-a-block. On the industrial side, are you seeing increased costs? Or are you seeing less square footage being able to build? So in other words, you're getting closer to a four per thousand instead of a two per thousand park facility. Are you seeing any of that on the industrial side? It's certainly the e-commerce fulfillment centers have changed kind of what they're looking for. I mean, they're heavy on parking, trailer storage, doors, drive-in van, you know, parking. I mean, so they've got a whole different set of criteria. A lot of times if a site is, you know, undercovered, that's what makes it good. I mean, gone are the days where you want to try to max out coverage as a developer because that really could kill you. Um, a lot of times, uh, developers are trying to build in phases so they can save the lot next door in case, you know, an e-commerce fulfillment center comes and they have extra parking, you know, and extra spots for, you know, vans, et cetera. So it definitely has changed, um, you know, quite a bit. I would say that um, the last mile infill has made kind of older functionally obsolete space now very usable because 
right. location, location, location. So we've sold some stuff that is, you know, in Orange County that's real close to the population base and it's maybe 16 foot clear and, you know, 19, you know, 70s construction, but it still leases out because it still, still works. So that actually was going to lead to my next question for you. So I, it wasn't even five to 10 years ago when we were trying to build higher buildings, we were looking for the 40 foot clear and we were looking to try to get to the sixties and they were doing two stories. Is that relevant anymore? Well, I would tell you this, Amazon keeps changing their model. You know, they've had this four story <laughs> model and, you know, a lot of people that were buying those as a exit were worried about the kind of long-term functional ability of the space. I would say that clearance is still important for new construction. But what the point would be is that older buildings that happen to have lower clear can still be functional because the in and out movement of these goods for last mile is so quick that you don't have time to put it on in, you know, kind of rack it and store it. So I guess it's good news for older buildings, but if you're building a newer building, we would not advise that you would build, you know, you know, you, you're going to build a, at least a 32, maybe, right. you know, up to 40 right. foot clear height. Got um, it. So I know most of the goods are coming through Long Beach and Los Angeles and where you really have the, the most density and the most desire on the industrial side is right there by the ports. And then you get to the Inland Empire. Where do you go after that? I know there's Arizona. I know there's Nevada. Are those viable markets in that uh, even though we're last mile, you still kind of look at your drayage costs? How, how desirable is Arizona and Nevada when you look at the California business climate, obviously coming down hard on businesses, do those become more viable? Or are they less viable? How do I compare the two or the three? So Arizona is on fire right now. I mean, it was probably hit the hardest during our kind of great financial downturn and took a long time to recover, but right now it is on fire. I think the uh, amount of folks that are moving from California to Arizona, the low tax of states of Nevada and Arizona are really gaining favor. We talked about the entitlement process in California. So, I mean, I guess the best news I've heard all week is that Prop 15 looks like it is, was a no vote. And hopefully that will allow us to retain companies in you know, California that might have left if that would have passed. And I don't think people understood that that could have had a big impact on the number of companies moving to Arizona and Nevada. There are certainly viable markets. But the interesting thing about California is markets that in my career at CV are now on fire are kind of interesting where, you know, Beaumont is doing great. We're selling land in Hesperia. Victorville is coming into it. So, I mean, it's just like all of a sudden these new markets, because we're running out of land, especially for bigger facilities. So there's some new markets here in California that are, you know, really coming into their own as well. As the world expands out to it. Exactly. So when you talk about some of the, you know, the Prop 15 not passing, I just heard the other day that San Francisco passed a wealth tax on uh, anybody over a certain dollar amount that was going to start paying for the schools up to 40%. So they went after a certain subset of individuals. So it's not, we're not done yet with all of the fun stuff we're seeing in regards to taxes. But Chris, I promise I'm not ignoring you. Uh, as we segue into changes that we're seeing, let's talk about work from home. Uh, I know that's big right now. I know for the most part, we're seeing 20% of people back in the space. Uh, small businesses to me have been in business and have been going to the office ever since March 1. Uh, larger companies with more risk and fear of liability have probably been doing 20% or so. Um, and I'm getting cross messages. And when I say that, you get Facebook out there saying, we're never going back until a uh, vaccine's in place. And yet they go off and buy a $400 million corporate headquarters uh, facility up in San Francisco. Netflix has said, we are going back to the office and bought another couple million square feet in Europe. This work from home thing, how is that impacting currently? And when does it end as far as, and does it end? Give me some of your feeling on that. I think it, I think it does end. I don't think it's, we're not all gonna be working from home in perpetuity as much as I enjoy being around my family and, and seeing them day in and day out. I, I like going to lunch. I like going and having face-to-face -face meetings. I like the collaboration. And some of the big tech users, while they're signaling to all of us that they're not Google or Facebook isn't going back to the office till 2022 or, or late next summer, 
they're still taking down space. We're building, we're doing large build the suits for them, or they've taken a big chunk of a spec building that we're that we're putting up in in Texas, and they're continuing to expand. So they know that there's a long lead time on that space. And just because they don't need it today doesn't mean that they won't need it in 12 or 18 months from now. And when it takes you 12 to 18 months just to build it, let alone getting things entitled and then designing it, getting it planned, checked, permitted, finance, all of that, if they can't be in a situation where they, they can't occupy and be in that collaboration mode, they'll be able to benefit from all of the advances that we've seen with Zoom and working from home. But I think the, the truth is that there is still a lot to be gained by having face-to-face -face interaction, at least in some sort of part-time capacity, if, if not all the time. I'm, I'm more somewhere in the center where I, I, like to, I would like to be home a couple days a week and enjoy the comforts of, of my house. But I think that I, I do benefit from going and, and sitting in a meeting with my colleagues from time to time. Well, I'm going to suggest or think that it's a tenant market uh, now just because of what's going on. Are you seeing any tenants, remember our dot-com bust in 2000 where they went and grabbed so much extra space because they knew they were going to expand? Are you seeing anybody kind of taking advantage of it and just trying to grab space at all? Or is it still just a play it by ear? I think not, not in Orange County. We haven't had anybody that needed to be in today other than these small spec suites. Uh, but we were out of large blocks, so I haven't seen much of that. But I do know that there's build to suit tenants in the market, and so we're we're chasing some of those, whether it's in Orange County or, or San Diego. Uh, life science can't grow fast enough. People can't the the developers can't throw up buildings quick enough, and so they they pay exorbitant costs to buy unentitled land. They'll move forward with. Uh, refurbishing an old building even though it's got less than stellar specs to put to put something up that they can they can market and tenants are taking it so that's kind of where the office market is today that's your you're either a build to suit guy or you're trying to get into life science because that's that's where capital wants to be and that's perfect. where the perfect so nicole i forgot to mention that if there's anybody that has a question offline that you wanted me to address just wave your hand and i'll call on you so I, I don't know if we're getting questions in the background that I'm not seeing, but just wanted to throw that out there before I. Yep, say. Eric, so we don't have any new questions, but I think that our audience might be interested in the take of our panelists um, on some of these existing questions. Um, going back to some of the, the topics you talked about over the last 10 minutes, one of the questions was, are we now getting inflated asset values, equities and home prices, for example, that might lead to a deeper recession. Perfect. So why don't we start with uh, Amanda and I'm going to tie that into, are we going to see, well, Barbara, I'm sure you're going to say industrial as far as how that's been elevated, but Amanda, I'm going to start with you. Uh, where as an investor, am I putting my money? Where's my risk of a bubble, if you will? And where's my potential upside as you're hearing from some of your clients? And then I'm going to hit every panelist with that one. So Amanda, you're up. Yeah, so I think obviously, and Barbara will you know attest to this, but I think you know obviously industrial is is the hottest asset type right now. But I think other asset types that are on the rise and that Chris uh, touched upon will continue to do well. Um, data centers, life sciences. Um, as Chris said, there's a ton of capital just flooding the life sciences right now. I think. This past month, we saw like 16 billion close on life sciences. So we can definitely anticipate that there will be an increasing need for research facilities, and labs, R&D, um, especially for hot markets like San Diego. And I think Orange County is starting to increase in that area. Um, I think, you know, another way to for investors to kind of stay successful and uh, not be hit by any recession um, is to focus on asset types that are maybe more resilient to changes in the economy. For example, there are a number of institutional investors that I'm seeing who are creating new funds or uh, creating these JV partnerships where they're specifically intending to develop or redevelop and operate self-storage facilities. 
Um, these are investors who had primarily been experts in multifamily office or industrial. So I think they're just, folks are trying to stay ahead of the curve, trying to be proactive, looking at where um, the market might not bust and uh, focus on those asset types. Got it, Chris. Sure, uh, can basically reiterate a lot of what Amanda said, but industrial's number one, it's high atop the list. And then tied second for second and third, is, in my eyes is probably dependent upon the market, multifamily or life science. So uh, okay. life science, everybody wants to be in it. Capital wants it and everyone's willing to, willing to take on a little bit more risk. They have to compete with an Alexandria who will buy things on entitled close in three weeks and go all cash. So it's a, they're playing defense and it's, but it's still a market where everyone wants to play. Not, I, I, I haven't seen it as much in Orange County yet. I think it probably may come up here because we do have great academic institutions, but the clusters are in San Diego and Cambridge and the Bay Area. And so Bay Area and, and Cambridge are, are one and two and San Diego is, has certainly picked up because those clusters exist being in and around UCSD and, and Scripps Institute and all the others. There's a high quality of life uh, being right next to the beach in, that, in and around that central county area, area. And then you look at the relative affordability. Rents are still in the four to five dollar range in, in those submarkets. Whereas you look in up north and or across the country and it's seven to eight dollars. So, and you can yeah. buy assets for, for cheap too on a per pound basis. So this is, San Diego's definitely picking up steam in on that front and you're gonna have to be aggressive to get in, but it's, it's definitely uh, the place to be. On the multifamily front, we're looking, we're very selective in terms of, of the location and the product type. We focus on the best product on the best site in the best market. So it really has to be a, a sub market that has a, uh, a compelling story about why they've been resilient or where there may be short on supply or demand continues, continues to grow. So um, well, that on the apartment side, are you afraid of rent control in California? And is that moving you out of California or is that not scaring you? Uh, we're still focused on growing. I think for now, the, the fact that it's, rent control doesn't really hit a new development for 15 years doesn't doesn't deter me today if it if it got a little bit more aggressive than that that might that might scare us but we were you know for lack of a, a better term we are merchant builders where we design some design and build and lease and, and sell uh, most of our product is is bought by our partners so it's it's going to build the core rather than something that just get in get out and be on to the next one okay uh, but yeah, we're, we're focused on that. And then we're, we do diversify a little bit. I think we're, we're also exploring product that's for necessity-based renters, groups that as a result of, of being a renter, their savings are depleted right now uh, due to COVID and they're probably not going to be able to buy in the near term. That, that is a, a reality. Costs in California are ridiculously expensive to be a homeowner. So there's always going to be renters. And so we're, we're looking at maybe not the, the high end push rates to the, to the highest possible amount. We're, we're going to satisfy the, the workforce housing as well. Perfect. So Barbara, I hate to tell you this, but I have been watching a lot of these cooking shows lately, especially for the holidays. They give you the ingredients and then halfway through, they say, here's your surprise ingredient. So please answer the question, but your surprise ingredient is with industrial so hot, that means the yields are really low. Obviously, lots of money chasing it. So yes, industrial is a great place to be, but where can I buy it with a decent yield on it or am I going to have to go? <laughs> Answer the question. Okay, so then where am I going for if I want to be an industrial buyer? Well, just to give you a quick real-time case study of a deal we're closing this week in Whittier, California on about a million square foot multi-tenant business park that uh, is owned by the Carpenters Union. Um, basically, it's going to trade. And Michael Kors is the biggest tenant in there. So kind of a credit risk per se, a little bit, you know, retail merchandising. Uh, it's going to trade at $300 a foot, which for an industrial, that sounds like an office building tray. And its cap rate is a 2.8% going in cap, which will stay <laughs> 
I know. Well, but you just you uh, it, it stabilizes at about a three and a half year two, so you get a little bit of a bump in year two. But um, we're selling buildings in the Inland Empire right now at two hundred dollars a foot. I mean, it's just the world has changed. Uh, if you want yield, you are going to have to go outside of California core class A. You probably, but even cap rates in values in Arizona and in Nevada and Utah have come in. So the spreads have definitely narrowed. It used to be a hundred basis point, you know, kind of spread if you went to other places and that's probably 50 now. So things are really uh, coming in. And I think that the People who are chasing yields will not be chasing industrial. I laugh when somebody calls me and says, I'm looking for an exchange. I want to buy an industrial deal and I want to buy a seven cap. And I'm like, I don't even know where to send you. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know where you go. But uh, anyway. Right. Well, so they, could, they could have said add value. Would that have been the same kind of conversation? Yeah, no, it's, it's tough. But um, the yields are definitely compressed and it is, it is tough. You got to be a little creative in today's world. So when does that end? Is this industrial? What's is this the cycle for a while? What and what could end it? What's my well, risk? Well, so this is what's happening. Instead of you know just in time, it's just in case. That's increasing inventories for industrial e-commerce. The charts show the numbers just going up, 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 and we'll see after this holiday season and more ad, you know adopters. And we're starting to see manufacturing come back into the U.S. People do not want to necessarily have all their eggs in China or in different places like that. So yeah. those three things are driving the industrial business, and that's not going to change quickly. And so because of those three things, I think we're here for a while of, you know, kind of some running room. And, you know, I think that uh, with, you know, COVID still sticking around, the just in case is going to be, you know, more and more, especially when it comes to medical, when it comes to consumer goods, et cetera, people are stocking up. Yep, I could see that. And, and part of what's going on is, is the interruption of the supply chain. So when you say the just in case is, is trying to bring as much of that supply chain as you can. And my understanding right now, and talking to a buddy at the ports is, is you've got a tremendous backlog and delay there based on chassis and drivers. So you're seeing even a hiccup just domestically, but everybody's trying to get product in and trying to get it out and it's not getting out. So Having the supply chain in house a little closer, I could understand some of that. So, well, Kwaku, there's, def there's, go ahead, definitely go ahead. Some, there's definitely some winners too. Uh, my brother in law sells outdoor heaters, and his business has never been so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Kwaku, let's go ahead and get your opinion on that one. Sure, sure. And so, I'm going to ask the question from the perspective of the phone calls I get, right, about where people want to focus their attention. So, we have a lot of folks that have given a great answer in terms of where they see the asset values. Um, and, and the categories aren't going to change much. I will add one uh, to it. So life sciences, uh, those calls are, are coming in. People are interested. They want to build something. They want to build it relatively quickly. Um, and behind industrial, I think those were where we're getting the calls. So I agree with those sectors. I have been uh, pleasantly surprised by the amount of interest in multifamily uh, and in housing still. Uh, I'm finding that, you know, and if you think about the market fundamentals, ultimately, if we believe there was a housing shortage before COVID, then there aren't less people that need homes. So when I take a step back, it makes sense, but just in the current environment, uh, and I think that back to the point of the mix of product that Chris touched on a bit, is that this, how do you blend an affordable product in with something that's going to attract those that want to live there, right? Because they're going to have some choices. And so, but we have this affordable housing or, or, or kind of middle income housing shortage. And so um, that's continuing to be a market that we're seeing. And as a result, I think from an asset standpoint, you know, money is seems to be flowing that direction more than I would have expected in the pandemic. One thing that's interesting with the office sector, and then I'll, I'll just add healthcare to the discussion for a moment because it, it hasn't come up yet. That's the thing about the, the office sector, and and you know, Chris can probably touch more on this, is that the companies that still have a means of sustaining their businesses, though they are working remotely more of the time. They actually, we included, need more office space for the same number of people from a density standpoint. And so there's this moment, can I say asset values are, are increased? It seems like people are still being careful. So it's hard to say they're inflated or believe that's the case. But the reality is I only have half the amount of people in the office, but I need the same amount of space to maintain density. And so uh, it, it's put in an interesting spot from what we're seeing office wise. So that's being driven really by tenants. And I think we have like entertainment tenants that are hurting a bit right now. 
Uh, you may be seeing that be a challenge in certain markets, but depending on the tenant mix you have, we're seeing that still have some legs, but, but not, not, not very high. I'm not over, overstating that. Uh, there's still some challenges. Last thing on healthcare really quickly. Um, healthcare is a market that we track and, and watch very closely. And uh, you're seeing as those main procedures are starting to come back, uh, they're able to be started that drive a lot of the revenue there and the supporting office and other functions that have there. I think healthcare is a market that uh, in pockets is going to have um, some opportunity. Uh, some of the clients that we're talking about, they've already, you know, with the regulations in that particular market, you have to plan the building you want to build sometime in advance, even if you're going design build. Uh, and so with that in mind, I think healthcare is another one's going to be interesting to see what happens with that market. But we see that clients are sitting there saying, okay, Kwaku, you're telling me your forecast says that Q2, Q3 of next year may be my opportunity if I'm going to get any, uh, you know, pricing advantage. Uh, and so how do I make sure my project's shovel ready now so that we're ready to go at that point? I could get that, uh, that value out of it. Yeah. No, it's, and before I turn it over to Nicole for final questions for everybody, it, the question is distress. Uh, are we going to see distress? And I know in talking to some of my special servicer friends, their level of stress, it starts at hospitality. That's number one. Number two is student housing. Number three is office. And number four is retail. Now, the first two with hospitality and student housing, that to me is a business run out of real estate. So it's almost doesn't count, but they're seeing office a little above retail. Are we going to see, and this is going to be a real quick rapid fire answer. Are we going to see distress to where I should save my powder because there's going to be great opportunities or not? Or is there so much money that we really aren't going to drop as much as we think? So Barbara, I'm going to start with you. Are we going to see distress in any significant level coming up here? I think we're going to see a little bit in, in certain segments, but I think California will remain fairly strong just because of our demographics. Perfect. Chris? I don't think there's a lot of distress coming. I think retail, if you are if you want to pick off deals, you should be doing it right now on the retail and hospitality side. I think what you may see is more, more sellers because they realize that land is worth, worth a ton right now still and they should be taking cash out if it's for a redevelopment purpose then they should be cashing out on it right now and letting letting a developer come in and put the highest and best use on it so we're not really seeing a lot of distress we're focused on people who are eager to, to cash out amanda i agree um so long as you know retailers and tenants are allowed to continue to operate um the recovery will happen. Um, I don't, you know, home buildings on the rise, industrials on the rise, um, hospitality. I think I read that we, Orange County, regained 38,000 jobs uh, since April or May. So as long as we can continue to adapt and, you know, implement these new uh, eating outdoors, putting in misters, putting in heaters, and just adapt, um, I think we will recover. Quick who? Yeah, I, I overall agree. I think that in some pockets, you'll see some, or you've already seen it, but I think the initial shock that impacted some of the job loss that we saw initially, um, it wasn't across all sectors. And so it's a little bit different kind of an economic impact or, you know, uh, you know, that we've had in other recessions, if you would. And so to me, um, I, I don't see a, a holistic, I think that overall, we're going to see something that's stable. Yeah, there'll be a couple of sectors that are, are going to feel the, the, the pinch there. All right. One last rapid fire question. Should I be a buyer, a seller, or do, it doesn't matter? Barbara. Doesn't matter. Chris. Product type specific. <laughs> but, go ahead, I, go ahead Chris. But buyer, life science, buyer, multifamily, seller, office, seller, hospitality, industrial, I don't know. <laughs> <Barbara>. <laughs> At a two cap, I'm a seller. <laughs> Amanda. Yeah, on the industrial side, I'm going to say seller. Um, just based on the last few months, a lot of my buyer clients are having to go through this bidding process uh, where you know they'll, they'll go through the first round of bids, then they'll go through a final round where they actually have to mark up the purchase agreement um, we're doing 20 to 30 day due diligence periods that start from signing of the access agreement or negotiating the PSA during due diligence. 
and we're closing five to 10 days after uh, diligence expires. So, so long as environmental is clean, um, we're moving quickly and buyers are really having to adapt to the seller's aggressive uh, stance. Quite good. How much money do you have and how eager are you to place it? Um, you know, the, the, you know, the term of the Me answer. Me personally. <laughs> term the answer to where you sit. Uh, it's short. Uh, I, it, you know, it sounds like a non-answer, but it, it really does depend on the sector. I think that there are great opportunities. The key is in deciding which way you're going to be, look beyond the next 12 months. Uh, because if you're stuck in that position, you might be paralyzed to do nothing. If you actually have some vision uh, beyond that, I think you'll find some opportunities relatively quickly. Perfect. Nicole, I know I'm past my time period, so I'm turning it back over to you. Eric, we have three final questions from the audience. Um, the first was, what is the um, rumored and much anticipated, what are their thoughts on some of the infrastructure spending or some of these proposed infrastructure programs from the federal government? Uh, the other one was going back to some of the things that Kweku said earlier, housing demand remains strong but permits are far from keeping up. So how does that choked off sales activity impact the housing industry? And then the last uh, topic is something we haven't touched on yet, but when we were having our convening calls, we were in the midst of three Orange County fires. How will these new natural disaster normals with wildfires affect real estate, housing prices, insurance, the whole bit? Got it. Well, Quaker, you nodded the most, so you get to start first. <laughs> so I want to make sure, because I, I had the question, <laughs> and, and then there, more kept coming. So, Nicole, I think the one, one that was directly for me, can you repeat it briefly, please? Yes. The question was... Housing construction. Yeah. Yes. Start, basically, demand so strong, but the permits aren't keeping up. So how yeah. does that choked off sales activity impact the housing industry? Sure, sure. U ultimately... Um, again, we're looking at a moment in time, right? And so the question is, uh, what was the permit activity prior to six or eight months ago, right? And who has been holding on that is now going to release that activity? Uh, and so in short, when I, when I look at permits, of course, they're a leading indicator. Of course, you should pay attention to them. But I, I would personally say probably a bit dangerous to look at just this moment in time and say activity is down in a window where people are most apprehensive. I'd reassess that uh, in about six months to see where things are, because I think that you, you may see some different statistics there would, would, would be my uh, guess. Love to hear other opinion on it. Yeah, I'm going to speak in a little tiny bit. Then I'm going to turn over to Amanda, because I know Amanda on the permit side, you're, you're seeing some activity there. First off, part of the, the things we're talking about with the afford, you call it an affordability crisis. To me, it's I've heard it explained more as not so much as an affordability crisis, but we just don't have enough houses. Uh, it's a supply demand issue. So we need more houses to be built. And when you think about our governments, we're more encouraged to build commercial than we're encouraged to build residential. So I think part of the shift we're gonna have to do is, is get our local governments to be incentivized to build residential. Uh, you build a shopping center, you get retail sales tax. You build a hotel, you get hotel bed tax. Uh, you, you tend to get some revenue from that. But on the housing side, you probably already have a police department. You probably already have a fire station, but then you've got schools, uh, additional classes. So there's a cost with houses. So finding a way to incentivize our local jurisdictions to build houses is I think one of the, the government steps they're gonna have to modify and correct. But Amanda, turning it over to you in regards to the, the question on the permitting, et cetera. Yeah, so I think uh, it, it is true that since the pandemic hit, permits have been issued on a little bit more of a slow basis, depending on what counties we're dealing with. Um, so I think one way, at least on the home building side, to, I guess, slow that down um, and, and to reduce risk on the residential developers is to kind of buy land in, in phases um, through like a land banking structure. So land banking essentially allows builders to tie up lots earlier in the development cycle without having to fork over um, large sums of capital on the front end when you're doing the initial purchase and the development. So the land bank would purchase the property um, on the home builder's behalf, take a deposit to secure that purchase. Then the builder would agree to a lot takedown schedule 
um, where they purchase a certain number of lots in phased intervals. So whether that's every month or every three months, uh, and, and that purchase will be for the value of the land and baking in some additional fees until all lots are purchased. So I think it's one way to kind of work with um, the cities and the counties in terms of getting those permits. Um, but the, you know, I think the cities and the counties understand that home building is on the rise and they're trying to adapt to that. So it's a little tough because all of our planning departments, they're working remotely as well. Um, so it's, you know, on our end, we have to push sometimes to get those through. Um, but we can just help that they that they adapt. Got it. And Chris and Barbara, if you want to say anything, just raise your hand. But in, in in answering to the wildfire question that came out, so at one point in my life, I was with LNR Property. We were partners with Lenar Homes. We had bought the Newhall Land and Farming Company, and we were building houses up in the Newhall Ranch area. And when you talk about wildfires, uh, there was a big one that took place up there. I forget. 15 years ago or so, it really does come down to the home builder building to safety standards. Uh, there are buffer zones that you are supposed to put in place uh, between houses and burnable areas. And one of the things I distinctly remember was the fire department uh, coming out and actually complimenting Lennar Homes on having put in the ice plants and having put in the, the buffers between the fire zone areas. And when a lot of other developments caught on fire, the development that they had done in Stevenson Ranch did not. So as we're, as we're looking at the wildfires, it really is going to be something where how much precaution are we taking? How much, um, how much, it, it, and that's easy to describe when you're talking about a master plan, but when you've got houses that have been built 30 years ago, that really just becomes more of a, a maintenance program that needs to be done by, by cities and local officials, but for any new development, there are plans in place that are supposed to protect those homes um, from wildfires through through buffers, through plant, uh, certain types of plants that you plant uh, and distances between trees and houses and things of that nature. So hopefully uh, that would be part of, the, part of the situation. Barbara or Chris, did you have any questions to answer in regards to the other original three or Nicole, was there another one to Throw out there at us. Question that I don't know if we that we touched on. Nicole, do you mind rereading re that? Yes, that one was. I think it was the infrastructure bill. Actually, was in one of the interesting ones out there. Yes, the much anticipated, highly rumored infrastructure, you know, proposal coming out of Washington. But how will that trickle down, and what are the implications for the various real estate sectors? Chris, you want to take that first? I want to give someone else a chance and certainly touch on that. I, you know, I'm not familiar with that bill, but I imagine that any sort of uh, any sort of uh, measure that's going to be uh, implied or, or applied would be something that just drives up our our fees. It's going to be either tax funded by taxes or the developers' fees, and so with larger fees, either something's got to give it's all there's only so much that we can underwrite and so either rents go up or land values go down or a combination of both but really it's the, the costs associated with something like that are going to be uh, kind of prohibitive to development but that doesn't mean that it's not needed because as we go denser on multifamily and in urban areas specifically you need you need more more infrastructure improved roads and and ways for people to get around. And in Southern California, we're all, you know, COVID excluded. We're bumper to bumper traffic in most most hours of the day. Yeah, it's employment, it's a labor. I mean, that's what our bullet train was, was, was some union sponsored labor during a downtime. Uh, and so I think more infrastructure would again be more jobs. Uh, and I think improving the infrastructure anywhere it's all crumbling United States wise, it would be positive. So that was kind of my, my synopsis of that. But again, in, in California, and I'm going to give UCLA some props. I was listening to the UCLA call the other day. We lost um, 21 million jobs throughout this pandemic. And when states started opening up, we put 11 million jobs back in place. So our economy, I think in, in California, we are 20% recovered. Well, we're also still in hibernation or we're still in, in shutdown. So for me, I describe our market as being in hibernation. As soon as they allow us to come back out, we will come back. And I think we will come back pretty quickly and fairly sharply because I don't think we're dead. I think we're just waiting for the starting gate gun to go off. 
And Jerry, I noticed you pulled yourself off of mute and are back on the screen. I'm not sure that means we're uh, out of time and you're taking us to the end or you had a question for us. Uh, it, it, it actually does mean that. Uh, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, Eric, to your point on infrastructure, you know, the last big infrastructure package or packages happened in uh, 2009 and we see the employment impact and the expenditures still going on today. So they spread out over a long period of time once they, once they come into place. So, you know, they don't have an immediate impact, but that does bring us to the end. And Eric, thank you very much for uh, a great panel and thank you to all of the panelists uh, this was fascinating and I learned a lot and uh, we have upcoming on the 9th of December, our next, it's actually our first forecast release post election. Uh, and it's going to uh, also have a theme, how climate change is changing business in California. So it speaks right to the wildfires, but also sea level rise and drought and how they affect California and of course on or Orange County. So that's going to be the morning of December 9th. Look forward to seeing you all there. If you have an interest in aerospace technology, we have joint with the uh, Department of Aerospace and, uh, and Mechanical Engineering of the uh, Samueli School of Engineering at UCLA, a conference the afternoon of December 1. Uh, so again, thank you all for being here. And before you leave, uh, I really want to thank our sponsors. Again, we could not put these programs on and do our research without them. Our principal sponsor, RSM, our platinum sponsors, University Credit Union, and the law firm of Alan Matkins. Our silver sponsors, California Bank and Trust, Lancy Homes, and Vaco, and our bronze sponsors, Clark, Colliers, Hathaway Dinwiddie, and MBK real estate companies. It's uh, with a, a real debt of gratitude and many thanks to our sponsors for helping us bring these programs to you. And uh, with that, we will close up the program. Thank you all for attending. Hope to see you in person next year. We hope that can happen and we'll be on the campus of UC Irvine. And, um, and until then, uh, be safe and uh, we'll see you virtually at some future programs.